Your light's not on. Okay, I'll call the meeting to order. It's a little after four, four twelve. Um, and first, I'll let Karina speak. Um. iPhone 15, can you hear me? Sounds great. <laughs> okay, Karina, go ahead. Um, so we did, we, uh, at the last planning board meeting, they had some major issues with the microphones. So um, we did a thorough kind of test run on them today. Um, we think the issue were the batteries originally, but um, one thing that we need to do is, and Jack, you're gonna be my biggest offender of this, Leaning back, it's not going to work. You have to speak into the microphone clearly, closely, um, for it to actually be clear on the other end of things. Um, we also have to take the batteries out at night and go through a couple motions in-house for cleanup stuff. But the big thing is, is making sure the microphone is on and also speaking directly into the microphone. Like, Tammy, you're going to have to pull that down. Say I'm not loud enough. I know, but... We're going to have to do this at the planning board level as well. Obviously, their meetings are a little bit more difficult than ours to maintain um, or to, yeah, maintain, I'll say. Yeah. Um, but we're hoping that we'll have no issues tonight. Energy conscious. Turn my okay. Well, well, you just spoke and it wasn't on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I All right. Well, let's, let's, be conscious of that as we have these meetings, speak into the mics. And then, I mean, maybe it just becomes procedure. You know, when we adjourn, we pull our um, batteries out. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Jane and I were thinking either that, or we would just try to first thing in the morning, have that be the first thing we do or before we leave when we're cleaning up nameplates, pop the batteries out or just something because um, the instructions do say the batteries will continue, the, the power will continue to drain even when the microphones aren't on. And we think that was the problem at the last planning board meeting is that some of the batteries were obviously dead. Okay. Gotcha. Um, let's, let's try it and, and see, it'd be nice if we could get it to work. Um, you know, at that meeting, we did put new batteries in some of them and it seemed to make a difference, it Definitely did. but then like when the, um, engineer was speaking over here he was actually like holding this microphone you know carrying it as he spoke and with he, the new batteries and and it was uh reported he was still having you know marginal um ability to to be heard online okay so let's let's try it okay all right so first order of business on the agenda is the minutes from the last time did anybody have anything i didn't I didn't either. No, nicely done. All I'll right. Make a motion to accept the minute. The okay. Minute so. of I didn't have anything Thank either. Good. Thank you, Jack. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of May 20 as presented. Second that. All those in Second favor? that motion. All those in favor? Aye. And I'll make a motion to accept the May 20 non public meeting minutes as presented. I will second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We need headsets. That way we can lean back and not worry about it. Oh, headsets. Yeah. Okay, you have to come on stage. We're going to run those headsets. Yeah, yeah, I got it somewhere. I hid it in my stuff to take home with me. <laughs> funny but not funny all right um that being done next on the agenda let's just go right to the town manager's report okay um so first on my report is the new pd usda grant application so we were notified by uh usda last week that there is a waiver application to be excused from the buy america build america requirements in our grant 
as the building is well under construction. So um, we, right now, they are only accepting applications for the projects that were um, accepted for the 22 and 23 uh, congressionally direct, uh, directed spending. Um, because we are 24, we have to wait to apply um, because the funding actually hasn't reached USDA's office gotcha. yet for it. So once um, we get the green light to to do that, I will be making that application. Um, I've already submitted the environmental report and the um, architectural feasibility report. Uh, USDA has reviewed the environmental report and says there are no concerns. Um, the next step would be the intergovernmental review from the Department of Energy, which I plan to have submitted by tomorrow. So we are hopefully moving forward in the that process. <laughs> Um, and a couple of the hoops we've had to jump through, but um, things have been going relatively uh, smoothly, knock on wood. So, the the go ahead, Joe. How much is that grant for? It would be a million dollars. Now, the Buy America, Build America requirements, mm -hmm. we're looking for a waiver for those. Correct. We don't meet those requirements. Well, the 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 the. The Buy America, Build America would require that any uh, building material, lumber, wood, steel, there's a whole list of them, would have to be produced and purchased uh, in the United States, which makes procurement of supplies much harder. So because we already have the building constructed, um, there's no turning back time. There's no deconstructing, right, right, right. Right. repurchasing, returning, returning and, and yeah. whatnot. Okay. So um, that would be our major request for the waiver. Okay. Okay. Um, next on my list is new health insurance op uh, options. We had our employee meeting with Health Trust last week uh, to discuss the two new plans starting July 1. Uh, feedback from the employees was mostly positive. Um, you know, a lot of questions about how they'll, how they'll work and potential payroll deductions, but I think for the most part, um, it was, it was a positive and um, we're hoping to, you know, jump on board on July 1. So. Excellent. Ms. Riley, so the library front steps. Uh, the library trustees received an updated quote from Jake Belanger for um, uh, deducting or taking out all the carpentry work that we were questioning whether it needed to get done or not. After a few people went out and looked at the building, they think those columns are not structural so that they would not oh, necessarily good. need to be removed and that whole section of the mm -hmm. building um, reconstructed. So Jake has revised his quote, um, and the new quote is for 37500 which um, we raised 30000 at town meeting, so which it would leave a balance of $7,500. i have talked to Carol about it, and we, uh, the library um, capital reserve, building capital reserve account has about $45,000 in it. Mm -hmm. We'll take the uh, balance the 7500 yep, yep. from there and then replenish it during CIP um, this summer. So the trustees have already met and they've already um, voted to um, accept Jake Belanger's quote. So I just told there was Carol another quote come. as well. Didn't you have a second quote or did you not get a. He... Oh, gotcha. OK. Mm. Carol, hold on. Can you go up to the microphone? I'm sorry. Oh, right, right, right. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> yeah, press the button. I can, yeah, I can there you go. just fine. <laughs> the, um, the second quote that we had gotten was from Paul Skipper from mm -hmm. uh, Romney, and his quote was different than what we had envisioned. He wanted to do... Um, a step at the curb to level out that um, little slanted area oh, yeah. that we had that was a tr that is a tripping area. And the trustees just didn't feel like that was something that they wanted to add. Gotcha. It was another stair to, yeah, to yeah, climb yeah. up. So we went back to um, Jake and asked him if he would consider um, revising his quote 
and he did at 37.5. Excellent. He's so a good guy. It will, it will be granite stairs, but the top landing will still be concrete and the bottom landing will be concrete. Gotcha. So that's that's what what his plan is. Perfect. I'm not certain when it will get done, um, but hopefully sooner than later. You know, Good. He's probably getting busy right now. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah. The time of year for it. Okay. You don't need anything from us. No, I just wanted to make you aware of it and kind right. of a general consensus that we're okay Fantastic. moving with that. So thank you, Carol. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Carol. Uh, employment opportunities. We began advertising last week for a planning board minutes recorder, a land use technician, and a land use slash code enforcement officer. Applications will be accepted until the positions are filled. We have received a few um, for the, I'll say couple, not few, uh, for the land use technician position. So now that's a full-time position? Nope. The land use, uh, excuse me, we received two for the uh Land use code enforcement officer. And that's, and that's a part time position. Gotcha. Correct. The land use te technician will be a full time position. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 40 hours a week, Monday through Friday. Excellent. Uh, route three. So, so oh, just sorry. on these, yes. you're advertising them. Um, are you in the courier? We uh, we put them in the, uh, the, the courier and the Plymouth Record. Plymouth. Okay. And HMA. Yep. Um, we also put it on Facebook, town's website, social media. Oh, good. And then, um, I also, as of last Friday, put them on, uh, just the, uh, land use technician on Indeed. Good. Okay. That was a good call, I think. Yeah, okay. I think just the land use technician sure. one, just to see what's out there. Sure. Um, and we'll see where it goes. Excellent. Uh, Route 3 water main replacement. Uh, New Hampshire DOT has approved our plans oh, for nice. the exit 34 off ramp. Um, we are no longer required to reroute the line and can pass straight through with um, by sleeving the line. So um, Sam hopes, Sam from uh, Kenny from uh, Weston Sampson hopes to have the bid out uh, this week for construction for uh, uh, the project to be started and hopefully completed in August. Excellent. Nice. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's awesome. roughly a month long project, right? Roughly a month long. Four yeah. Weeks, four yeah weeks. Four weeks. Um, you know, that's, that's best case scenario, right. but um, they if hope they start in August and go into September. Go into September. Okay, yeah. yeah. Hopefully to have it definitely out to bid, obviously out to bid this week for construction this summer, early fall. Okay. Fantastic. And someone is going to be in touch with Peter Spanos about timing once that reaches that stage. I would, um, I would hope so. Because, yeah. you know, shutting off water there is pretty critical and um parker's motel as well and parker's motel they're going to be the two biggest ones that will be impacted okay so the indian i will confirm that with nate i mean donnie landry is also up there and there's one home up there there's one but, home yeah I'll just make sure that whenever yeah. we shut off people water, know. we are coordinating it yeah, with yeah. the people who um, are, gonna be are servicing. Yeah, we're sure. on that service line. Sure. Um, yeah, it was giving the Parkers and the um, Indian had as much Heads advance up. notice as mm -hmm. you can. Yeah. Okay. I will make sure to get that to Sam tomorrow. Um, South Peak Water Tank. So we received notification notification from the forest service that we must install erosion control measures along the path created for the geotechnical equipment. Uh, Nate will be working with the DPW crew this week to address that concern. Um, it is quite the undertaking to get some straw and hay bales all the way up to mm, the uh, sections that they are looking for. So uh, it is probably going to he's going to have to dedicate most of his week. So he, he asked the forest service last week for uh, specifically where they're looking for where are the where are their high priority areas and exactly what they're looking for so we don't waste our time going through the motions sure. and um having it not what they want it to be right so um nate's going to be working on that this week um we also um are required to pay out the timber tax for the felled trees um, that we took down during that. So our total timber tax um, was $1,065.14. So uh, that is being paid this week. 
and that's just coming out of the the water tank water construction yeah, construction project yeah okay so, this is related to the south peak water tank did we hear anything back from um south peak and their attorney on the extension of that not a peep okay i know they they got a few other things in the works right and then you did review at the last meeting jason's kind of thoughts on that correct yeah mm -hmm. okay yeah mm -hmm. okay you just mentioned hay bales i mean we're going to use salt socks or it, it, they want they some want, straw. They want hay. They want hay bales. They want they want not the hay and the silk sock. They want hay. They 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 want straw placed. They didn't. Um, I don't know specifically what they're going to tell Nate to do, but I think it's actually Nate's going to be. We have to buy the straw from a certain place because it can't have invasive species, and it's it's a very thorough process. We yeah. had to get grass seed that was very specific to the kind of grass seed that they wanted. It was. $30 a pound. Um, so we're just trying to do exactly what they want us to do yeah, to stay in their anymore. good graces. Yeah. It's not cheap anymore. So, okay. Um, Mansion Hill subdivision, ZBA appeal. I'm sure you've already heard this by now, but the, um, the, uh, Anna Butter, uh, from in the Mansion Hill development has, uh, uh, applied for, um, an appeal from uh, the planning board's decision. The first step would be to go to the ZBA with that appeal. So uh, Carol is noticing that as we speak. For the minutes, can we just state the planning board's decision and what they're appealing? Um, they are, well, the planning board approved, a, a, I think it's a 25 lot subdivision. Yeah, 20 um, something, and, and it was a, a four to one vote with, um, Paul Bowden, myself, Jim Spanos, and Joe Chenard voting in favor, Steve Noseworthy voting against to approve the project um, as it was in its revised state after numerous mm -hmm. changes because of the planning board mm -hmm. process. They came back with several revisions, um, and we voted to approve it. And and they've appealed that. I'm not sure if there's specific. There is specific. So in the appeal, read... um, I have it actually here. I can make copies of it for you all. Um, they are the the basis of their appeal um, is pretty much that the planning board was inconsistent in their uh, usage of the definition of usable space. It, it is okay. So. Gotcha. Um, the planning board made the decision to not include steep slopes. The planning board made the decision not to include uh, drainage systems. Um, it seems as if the drainage system is where their key focus is, and it is really truly on two of the lots, not the whole subdivision. It's uh, the two of the lots where the duplexes are, mm -hmm. um, where if you deducted the drainage system from the calculation of usable space, that they would not have enough usable space for that to be a duplex. So that's really where it focuses on. So they have a ZBA meeting coming up. They have a ZBA. The ZBA up. hearing will be held on June 19th. On that day. Okay. I have this too. I'll leave this for you if you want. Yeah, to I want to. I haven't read it yet. Okay. Um. Uh, Campers World Closing. Um, I reached out to Mike Conklin's office to prepare the closing documents for the sale. I panicked a little and was like, oh my goodness, do we have to do something? <laughs> so uh, Mike Conklin's office is going to be handling that for us. He did say that he's run the title. Oh, that's title report. He ran the title report and everything looks good. However, there are a couple matters to note. He says he's going to put them into a title insurance commitment report for us. So we should have that shortly. I'm meeting with Rennell um, from Divine Millament mm -hmm. on Wednesday to go over the final piece of our commitment. Um, she said uh, it should take 30 minutes. It's just a relatively kind of formality that we just have to go through the questions together. Um, we will have the closing documents for the board on our next meeting on June 17th. So we will sign the closing documents then. And then uh, we should receive funding within the day or two after that. And then we can coordinate with the bank and um, to the closing company to make 
that sort of transfer or whatever needs to happen um, at the time of the sale. Uh, the closing is still scheduled for the June 28th, as far as we know. June 28th. 8th. Yeah, Friday. Excellent. We are very lucky that the Clark family is, was willing to work with us and wait and go through the whole municipal bureaucracy that was <laughs> yeah. yeah, the hoops that we have to yeah, jump no, through. That was, they didn't have to, and they did, and I appreciate that. So, yep, so that no no hiccups in that as of yet. Okay. So, for, for later on tonight, um, just want to make sure that we're all on the same page as far as, oh, I didn't even turn it over. I didn't turn it over yet. I forgot I'll, I did that. I'll let you finish your report. So, just so, uh, <laughs> for Campus World Public Info session tonight, um, we are going to have Andrew Dorsett, who is the Housing uh, Finance Director for the State of New Hampshire mm -hmm. uh, for the Department of BEA. Uh, Harrison Kanzler, uh, he's the uh, executive director at AHEAD. He will be here. Kevin Lacasse, um, unfortunately, gave me a call this afternoon. He is um, no longer available this evening. They are closing out a project in Berlin, and his partner was going to go to that meeting, and he was going to come here, but schedules conflicted. And so Life he, happened. He said he's still very interested in the project and wants to be brought up to speed afterwards. Um, we also were having a conversation on Wednesday. Um, but he he will no longer be here. And then uh, Michelle Morin Gray will be here from Rough Country Council, but she'll be on Zoom. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. And are they all familiar with where we are in the process so far? Yes. Okay. So I don't need to do a whole like long history and explanation or no i mean i think a brief synopsis i think is fine but yes i've had personal conversations with each one of them they kind of understand how we got here with the petition warrant article okay. and we're in the initial kind of stages of planning mm -hmm. um and kind of figuring out what is the best best path for us um so yeah they are aware i will say this that um I also spoke to uh, Angie um, Cleveland from North Country Council. Uh, she um, can't be here tonight either. She's got another meeting in Warren, but she's the new Kayla Tavares. She's their new okay. housing person. Um, they received funds from, uh, they have some grant funding that they need to uh, expend. And I know that Angie said that she was meeting with Harrison uh, over the weekend to discuss Lincoln specifically and how they can team up together to potentially um, get us some funds to help implement whatever we're looking to do. Fantastic. So I'm sure they'll talk about that tonight. Wow. Okay. I'm going to introduce this as a public information session and that the goal is to listen to these experts to come and talk to the board and talk to the, to the citizens about what our options are, as opposed to, um, and, and, you know, if, if, if there's questions, there should be questions about the programs or the ideas that these people, I don't want to just get delving down into whether we, we should even be developing it ourselves. And I mean, that's, that's not a decision that I see us, we're just getting on information tonight. tonight. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think it's we should focus on the resources, right. their experience in the field, you know, yeah. I guess the pros and cons or best practices that they've seen work or whatnot, um, and just what sort of resources either the state or AHEAD or North Country Council has to kind of help us uh, see this project to fruition. Right. Okay. They're all very excited from what I can tell. Good. It's an exciting Good. project. Yeah, it is. I'm I'm excited about this meeting just to yeah. learn. Absolutely. You know, like what? Yeah, yeah. So, all right. Anything else? Uh, no, I do have one more thing that I didn't put on my um, town manager's report though, but I did want to touch base with um, Nate came and um, well, it's actually two things. Um, Nate came and talked to me about buying another bench. He said that you had spoken to him about buying another bench. Are we buying another bench? Okay. Get on your microphone. No, I called him the other day because one of the constituents said we hadn't put no put out the new bench that we bought last year. And Nate and Nate, well, Nate said he hadn't and he would be doing it. Oh, okay. Yes. I Nate, I guess I guess Nate thought he was talking thought you were talking about a new bench. 
Never use the word no. Okay. So, <laughs> so the bench we bought last year is out and decorated and beautiful. Thank you, Tammy Ham. It has gorgeous flowers. And beautiful. Yes. And that was yeah. three weeks ago. I was going to say it was I mean, there. To, yeah. He was there when we went to the PD visit last week. That's so when I first yeah. saw it. it was yeah. coming home from the PD visit. Yeah. Okay. Know. I just wanted to make sure. And I like, if we're buying it, it's about every day. Okay. Unless it rains. So perfect. Um, that was quick. And Although, easy. while we're talking benches, sure. We had spoken about last year getting a bench um, to put up at near the medical center uh, for Dr. Felgate for his 50 plus years of service to the towns of Lincoln and Woodstock. Okay. Um, and I know we discussed it and said, yeah, we'll look into it. And yes, let's do something. And then life happened in that gut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to get back on that. Okay. If we could. Weren't we going to do something like a little bit more, um, not like the benches that. No, like yeah. the granite type, I right. think is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Something that, and because um, the, the, uh, you know, what's going to happen with that building is unknown. It wasn't going to be, you know, planted eight feet in the ground. We were right. going to do something that could be moved if, <clears throat> excuse me, if needed to be. So, which, I mean, is pretty much anything. You put a couple of blocks, like they did with the, the one over there. They set those blocks in the ground and set it on it. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I will try to get that back on my radar. Do you want me to, you, you want me to put it on my radar and see what I can find? Sure. Yeah. Okay. If you don't mind. I don't and mind. Then, um, yeah. Send me some options or bring them here and then we'll. I'll just get it and let you know when it's done. <laughs> let me know how much it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's talk about yeah, what know, we're I'm getting. Like, what I'm it costs. Kidding. I'm kidding. OJ. But, but, but also um, where we're going to put it. I just am wondering how much longer that's going to be. I mean, if, if we get something and get it in in the fall and it only is there for a year and a half. Well, I did. It was mentioned to the school board at a school board meeting and they were all completely in favor of it, but cautioned that it not be something planted eight feet in the ground just in case it needs to be moved. Um, but it could stay, even if it needed to be moved, it could be moved back to the property was the, the um, impression that was given at the school board meeting. So, okay. All right. Because, so long as it's yeah. something that's semi-portable, that right, right, move right. It. Yeah, because we don't know what's going to happen with exactly. that with that yep. property. Okay. Um, the other thing I had, and I don't know if you spoke about this at the last meeting. I think you might have touched base on it. We did receive a letter from Kathy Cook in regards to her um, property. Did Nate follow up with her? Uh, we did. We did talk about that last meeting. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, she submitted an email to the selectman regarding the alley behind her home, Corby mm -hmm. Lane, and a crack in her driveway. Uh, Nate had gone to take a look at it and noted that Corby Lane is scheduled for repaving this year, but he feels the deterioration in her driveway is really due to the frost and weathering um, as there is no drainage in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he explained to me, like, the, the water sh sheds off the road, and it does that over that whole area and any cracks or, you know, it, it's the frost and the ground and all of that. And, and that, that it's the, the road is working the way it should be. Right. Um, well, I guess it kind of brings up a bigger conversation because I, I, we do have the back alleys on the paving schedule for 25, but I do know now that there um, has been some discussion at the ZBA level regarding what our maintenance responsibilities are on these back alleys. We've been there, done that. Right. And is it, I know that they're on the paving schedule, but should they be on the paving schedule, yes. I guess, is a bigger question. And, you know, Nate and I discussed it and we will. Peter, there, there's records and in, in, in selectman's meetings, Peter Malia weighed in and it, there was research done and the whole bit. And yes, um, due to the fact that they've been maintained by the town of Lincoln and not just the mill, but the town of Lincoln since before I was born, before most of us were born. Um, yeah. that it is the responsibility of the town of Lincoln. However, but, uh, we are not responsible for bringing them up to like class six roadways. We're responsible for maintaining them, um, plowing them. And in order to plow them, we need to keep them maintained to in order to plow them. Right. But I think that's different than putting a one inch, you know, I, I think, I think 
that's different than I think maintaining them at a I don't want to say low or there's there's some very specific language that was mm-hmm. that was voted yeah, that on that was right okay and and I don't, I don't know if the word minimal was used but it was something right equal that's what I'm to saying that, yeah that that they would be maintained at a minimal level um basically in order to keep them smooth enough to to, to plow, plow them right. right um they're not going to be widened they're not going to be you know Dug additional up and put new base right. yeah. down. It's, it's minimal drainage. Enough. Okay. Basically, we're we're agreeing that the town will plow them, and we're going to keep them in good enough shape that they don't ruin our plows. Okay. That was that's yes. my interpretation of I, I agree. official language. We can go back and look that up. No, I think you're. I think you're right, and I but, guess. But um, that question is: Does that mean putting you know a one inch binder coat on all of them, or you know whatever? That may, and I, I guess mean, that, that's that up would to Nate's discretion. Like, okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, that's a judgment question. When I drove on that particular section of road when I was looking at this, it didn't seem like they needed it. But then again, is it going to cost us more if we let it get, you know, destroyed and then go out and, and right. try and, well, and I think Nate's feeling Nate is, too, it is, is if they're not going to gonna need it this exactly. summer and they're probably not going to need it next summer. Okay. And that's the thing too. Even if it's scheduled, if it doesn't need it, he's not going to do it. Just it to he's do not going to do it. To, no, it's exactly. It's not just no. those words, roads, but any of them. Correct. So he's very good right. about that. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to let so Nate. That's up to Nate. Okay. He'll know if they need to be done or not. He's the one that maintains the plows. So he would know when he wants to. You might perfect. also want to take a look at the um, language that's been passed in, you know, previous meetings or what have you. And have run it by the attorney, um, just so we don't run afoul of the law. Oh well, Jason Dennis has been very much involved in oh, okay. this going on back okay. there. So yeah, okay. Right. I was like, yep, yeah, they were at the time when that that language was developed. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There was attorneys involved mm-hmm. in yes, whatever that language said. And I think the word minimal, but or something. I'm very, pretty sure it did say minimal. minimal. I knew it said something that was. Um, I don't know. When that was voted on, if that was at a town meeting or a selectman's meeting, but it's um, it's been voted on, and we probably should find it and get that exact language. And yeah, yeah, I, I think we have it somewhere. I've okay. seen it a bunch of times since okay. this new ZBA case has come up. Okay, so. okay, and then also at the back of your packet is just the Fourth of July celebration flyer. Mm-hmm. We have been getting a couple calls from people just questioning what day the fireworks are on and if the parade is still going to stay, but um, nothing, nothing too crazy. This year's theme is uh, American landmarks. Yes, that was announced last week. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Very fun. So, uh, and that's all I have. Some of the ideas right. that I've heard around are going to be. Awesome. <laughs> we have a tax collector's warrant that we need to sign telling our town clerk to collect your tax collector. S- uh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Exactly. Telling our tax collector to, to collect taxes in the amount of $7,592,653 with an 8% um, annual uh Eight percent per annum interest from July fifth, twenty four thereafter on all sums not paid on or before that day. So, basically, we're telling them to send out those tax bills and pay them by July. Yes, please. Fifth. Yes, please. They did go out a little bit late. We did run into a couple of little snafus. We are using the avatar system now, so oh good. We went from vision to how did the, the avatar change shell. Go? Honestly, I didn't even. How mm-hmm. did the change go? Uh, relatively well. Like I said, we had a couple snafus. Um, just making sure. So what we had to do is we had to take all the assessing information out of vision and put it into an avatar assessing shell, and then that avatar assessing shell now needs to then. <clears throat> speak to avatar tax collect so in the process from vision to the assessing shell we ran into a couple little snafus where some of the pid numbers weren't registering we had a couple duplicate things that were just triggering us um to have a couple errors so it took us a week or so to kind of work through all those with avatar but as no not bad at all and avatar's customer support has been great yeah Yeah, it's um yeah. Great. So tax bills, you know, like I said, are going to go out a little bit late, but um, a week or two is not going to kill us. And um, 
we're we're in good shape now. So. All right, and then one other thing, we received an official notice from the town of Lancaster. They have received a uh, application to put up a basically a cell tower, and that has been designated as a project of regional impact and we fall in that 20 mile radius oh, of this cell phone lies, yeah. so so we've been notified if anyone wants to attend meetings and hear about it all the information is is on here so i'm making that you know you want to i don't think <laughs> um but if someone's interested lancaster's putting awesome. one up and we're invited to go to their meetings um i get a few things just to run down that um, we already talked about the South Peak tank agreement, and that's kind of just waiting. Um, talked about Kathy, and we talked about microphones. The um, one thing I'd, I know, I know there's a lot going on in the planning department. One thing to put on the back burner, but not too far back, <laughs> is to relook at the uh, fees that we charge for the various planning board related um, applications and submissions. I was just talking to someone and they couldn't believe what the town of Lincoln charges for a, you know, a, like a, a large um, uh, planned, you know, uh, planning board approval for a, for a site plan, mm -hmm. Sub, uh, a subdivision, but this is more in the, um, you know, a project, you know, I'm going to build a hundred condos. Mm -hmm. And and they they said in in such a such a town, this would be X amount, and in Lincoln it's fifteen hundred dollars. <laughs> Maybe we need to look at what what we're you know, and I you know my my goal here isn't to you know try to screw whoever we can to get as much. My goal is if a project is big enough that it's going to consume X number of hours between you know, Carol and mm -hmm. whoever else works on the project, um, we should cover that. Um, and that might take some um, time and thought as to what that that uh, amount should be. It might be a sliding scale, you know, if the project is X to Y or Y to Z, you know, different different rates. But I didn't know if that's something that 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 Carol and the whole team might want to talk about um i i absolutely i know that i have spoken um to paul bowden recently in in, in for that exact in <laughs> about that exact thing um that you know if we could help um you know we we are going to have to bring in more planning people you know this technically this land use technician is an, an additional person on board um it would be nice to not, I don't want to say offset our costs, but somewhat offset our costs for the additional, you know, workload, the additional bodies we need in house mm. to keep up with the workload. So I, I think, um, I would be open to that as well. Okay. Is that something like, can we, can we put yeah. a target like by the end of summer, could we at least have a, I think that's fair. Yeah. Proposal or, you know, suggestions of what, you know, and I'm not saying every fee. Let's let's look at the. I mean, we've we've talked fairly recently about water and sewer tap fees. Um, bedroom fees were established by the town meeting town vote. meeting vote. Yeah, I believe. Yeah. Think that that's that we have the power to change that. I don't think I, think I don't you're think right. we need to change that. Right. Um, but anyway, let's let's take a look at that. Along with that, um, two other planning related things. Number one is we had a sewer capacity study done a while back. Mm -hmm. I don't know what year that was. Um, and that was done based on all of the currently approved projects. So it's not what we're using in the sewer. It's what, you know, all of these approved projects are going to bring that use up to in theory. Mm -hmm. We have since then approved several projects, and it seemed like it would be fairly simple math to say, okay, these are already included. Like all of South Peak was included, all of Forest Ridge was included. Okay, what have we approved since then? Well, there's a Hampton Inn, there's a, you know, one, one of these, one. Where are we at now? Um, 
and I think that should be updated um, annually if we can. I mean, at this, at least if growth is going to continue like it has been, just update that annually. Mm -hmm. Think too that you know we're at what 68 69 percent capacity of the sewer treatment plant so when these new um units are coming before the planning board obviously they're going to have an impact on water systems they're going to have an impact on sewer systems and that's big bucks so i mean we've got to be on the ready to you know address those issues when they come so i think it'd be a good idea to get something uh you know something simple that, you know, a calculation, okay, you added 12 new bedrooms there, multiply that times a factor and included that in what, what, you know, we have to do. So. Yep. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's a bad idea. I do think that, um, you know, most, the majority of the projects that have been approved recently are already within the calculations, but there are some, like you said, a couple of the, we got two hotels, Mansion Hill, um, there are some things that probably should be included and have those figures updated. Just, just to update it. Just, yeah. you know, we don't want to be surprised. No. Um, <laughs> no. You know, I'm, I'm not as concerned about the water. Mm -hmm. Um, just because really we have the the uh, permission to withdraw more water from from the river, and the um, additional cell, additional cell, to add. And and there's a funding mechanism for that to take place, so that should all just, you know, fall into place just like the third cell did. Mm -hmm. When it came time to do it, we just paid for it. Um, and then the, the the other thing related to planning board is a, um, a a second third party engineer that we had talked about. That is, is have we had any um, discussions with other engineering firms, or where do we stand? We haven't. Okay. Um, we, I don't want to say that that was a moment in time, but it seems as if a bubble burst at that point and we were bogged down um, in regards to, I, I think it was somewhat of a perfect storm of the amount of applications we had on the table. We had some staff absences. We had some medical stuff. We had a couple things that kind of um, added to the tension and contentiousness of the, those conversations. That has somewhat subsided. Do I still think we need to look into a future solution to that? Absolutely. But um, it kind of been on my back burner um, because that immediate need has seemed to um, kind of dissolved. Okay. And I will agree that, that the two steps that you have taken were of higher priority in my mind <laughs> that we're going to get a, a hopefully a, a new compliance officer yeah. and a, a new, new technician. So, um, but like I said, I do think, um, just for future proofing the town, we should have a mechanism where if we get in that scenario again, and we know that we are not going to be able to do things in a timely fashion, that we have another avenue to go down. Uh -huh. um, I do think we need that. Um, but I just haven't gone down that far yet, down that rabbit hole yet, I guess. Okay. okay. I think that's all that I had. Do you have anything? No. Jack? A couple, couple quick things. Um, number one, have we heard anything um, as far as a rebuild or what's possibly going to go where we had the fire? So the owner of that um, property came to the planning board just for a conceptual um, discussion. And by our ordinances, he has the right to build the same um, square footage on the same footprint at the same location in the same volume. So like that building went up and then it went in. So whatever the square total square footage is, he can rebuild that. Um, his desire is to move that building from where it was away from Pleasant Street because the corner of that building basically sat on the town's right of way for uh, the, uh, the ownership, I guess, of mm -hmm. Pleasant Street. 
um, there was zero clearance between the, the foundation and the road. So it would be to our best interest if he actually did move it away from the road. I assume it was pretty difficult to plow that, mm -hmm. that spot. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, and you live out there. You see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so, and sometimes if there's, if there's, um, you know, someone parked in front of that duplex and someone parked at the corner of the, the building that was there, you, you couldn't, it more often, not more often than not, but it, a few times I've had to turn around and park in the parking lot and walk up the street because there was, mm. I, you know, you let's sit there with your horn, lay on your horn for a while. No one comes out and you just give up. <laughs> so, anyway, that, that the, his, his desire was to do that and then also to put it closer to Main Street. Um, which which is more still well within the the setback from uh, from the frontage, uh, and that would allow more parking behind his building. Right, because he's so, going to need the parking. So it's a win-win. Right. You know, more um, setback from the town road and more parking behind the building is a win-win for him. It's a win-win for the town. Um, and we just talked about the ways that he could go about doing that because it doesn't officially fit into with, with what the ordinance says about rebuilding a fire damaged building, mm -hmm. because it's not going to go on the same footprint. Um, but, you know, there was, there's no obstacles. Just, I think, to, I think there will be one obstacle when he comes back in. Cause I do think he's going to propose to make some changes and that's going to be parking. Um, because if he plans to have a commercial business on the bottom and residential ap ap apartments on the top, um, I did last we spoke, was... he, parking was going to be tight. Okay. The the um, discussion with the planning board was that they weren't thinking of putting commercial space on the yeah, first that's floor. Yeah, good. The okay. conversation okay. I had as well, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that we're going to eliminate and strictly residential. Perfect. And I think that that's going to eliminate that problem. And and again, it's it's going to be. He may not have the exact number that's required by our ordinance, mm -hmm. but he's going to have more than was there per year. Per unit prior. Yeah. Right, right. So so um, again, it's 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 going to improve the parking. It's right. going to improve the setbacks. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it, there's there is a path forward. And again, he's it was just a conceptual. He might come in and say he wants commercial, whatever, but. Right. As that wasn't no, summer. because I've heard, you know, a couple of people approached me and said they heard that he was not going to bill because he didn't get enough money out of his insurance. That's why I brought up the issue. Oh. I mean, if he's come before the planning board for a conceptual, you know, then I assume that's straight shot forward. But again, you know, rumors fly. And, yeah. you know, at least it's been discussed here. I can go back and say that. For this summer, they have applied for um, a special events transient license so they can put two food trucks, two food trailers on the property so they don't go a whole summer without getting any sort of revenue. So um, you will see them there this summer, two food trucks. Oh, that's, well, that'll give them some revenue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that'll help. So the other issue, look out the window there. He was going to start last fall. What's going on across the street? Uh, we are still waiting for him to submit all that he needs to for, at the building, pro, at the fire marshal's office. Right now, it's out of the town of Lincoln's hands, and it's in the state of New Hampshire fire marshal's office hands. Because I know, you know, demo started, did very quickly, very efficiently. Yep, we haven't received the water sewer tap fees. We okay. still, he... Drew, Drew is aware of the items that he is missing for the town, and he's also aware of what his next steps need to be. Okay. As recently as last week, I spoke to him. So great. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yep. All right. If there's nothing, nothing else, then let's go to um, public participation. David. Uh, David, can you stand up to the microphone, oh, yeah. please? Please. And push that little button and turn it on perfect thank you concerns about the health insurance and it's a i don't know it's a personnel issue i don't know if it should be in public or non-public because if other employees get mentioned is that appropriate or we I should probably do it non-public now but if you probably shouldn't mention other employees if you want to speak in generic terms okay. I think that's okay, but yeah, let's not no. reference anyone specifically. But also, yeah. if you need to go into non-public, I mean, that's something we could do. Sure. We, it's up to if you. If you can speak about family plans and single person plans without saying so-and-so's. Okay. 
Thank you. And that was from 2018 when it got amended, when the town changed the plan to eliminate everything. Every any new employee got single person, and that was it. Right, right. And it grandfathered those people who were here before a certain date. It sta states that in there. And I don't think it's fair to me as an employee who's been here for 25 years to have to now start and take, you're taking a part of my benefit away by making me pay for some part of this. It, it, it's, we're, it's, we're paying for the, the yes. whole 100% of the, of the plan, right? We are. We're, the only thing we're not paying for is the deductible. So as... What I have said to Dave is it, it's my understanding or it's my understanding of the personnel policy that we are still honoring the personnel policy because we are giving our employees a health uh, insurance plan at no cost. There are going to be costs associated with your health care, though, like your co-pays. We weren't. Those, those are there now. Those are there now. Those were there before. A copay and a deductible, in my mind, are a similar level of costs associated with health insurance. Not a. What I believe the personnel policy states is is that it would come at no cost. That means no payroll deductible to the employee. You're not paying any part of the premium of the plan of the right. plan. It doesn't mean that you're not going to incur health insurance costs. It just means. The plan itself, to purchase the plan itself, is not going to come at any cost to the employee. Right, which it's not. That's, which it's not. That's where we're still maintaining. But the deductible is part of the plan. And I asked the insurance guy here last week when he was here if that was considered part of the plan. And it is. So that's but, part of the health insurance plan. But it's not part of the cost of the plan. The cost of the plan is still being covered 100% by the town. But the deductible is not. And I realize the town's paying half of the percentage of it. But that's still a cost to me. And it says right there, and, and two of the select board that are sitting up there now signed that personnel mm -hmm. policy mm -hmm. that said at no cost to the employee. Jack wasn't here at the time. Yeah, um, we did have this discussion as a board. Yeah. We, when we, when we um, chose the options that you were presented with, there was two options that you were presented with for for plans, and that that I guess we felt we discussed this and felt that we were presenting, we were presenting a plan, um, that the town is paying a hundred percent of that plan, and again. But the deductibles co co change, change, deductibles change. Um, we saw this as a huge um, increase in in benefit overall to to the to the town employees. True. And, all right, go ahead. I'll let you finish, OJ. Okay, I, we saw it as a big, big, you know, increase in benefit as to what we were doing. Um, <clears throat> again, without anyone taking a step backwards. Now, now the again the the deductible. And co-pays change with with the different plans. We could have chosen a plan with higher deductibles and more co-pays. I thought we chose a pretty fair, aggressive plan, really. And, and and if you look at the personnel policy, yeah, it does state in there that if anybody wanted additional coverage, they would have to pay for that. That's to me is what I'm looking at now. Employees who either our current or the new hires are going to come in and they're going to get a, a full family plan at no cost to them other than the deductible. And I'm not gaining a thing out of it. I don't care about gaining anything, but I'm, I shouldn't be charged for it. I guess we just don't see it the same way. Yeah, I didn't think so. I didn't think we would. Yeah. But and I, I know Jack is kind of like knows sayings and everything like that. And I just wonder if you heard the one, I like to get kissed when I'm being screwed. Because <laughs> that's just exactly what this is. It's a more of a slap in the face for somebody who's been here 25 years and now turning and have to say, 
okay, I got two more years, three more years, whatever it is till I retire. I got to start paying for my insurance. And Tammy sat there at two meetings ago and said, oh, whatever the employee, whatever's good for the employees, whatever's good for the employees, three or four or five times. And I don't feel this is good for this employee. And I'm only here fighting for myself. I don't care about anybody else. Dave, I understand your point of view. I do. Um, but I think it's I think it's hard to call it a slap in the face. I think it's unrealistic to think that over 25 years, your health insurance plan was not going to change at all in the current environment and the current economy. Your health insurance plan is still coming to you at 0% cost out of your pocket, other than your co-pays and your deductible. You, up until today, never came in and asked for a reimbursement for your co-pays, did you, or oh. your pharmacy bills? So in my mind, and I think those things are similar, like plans change, employers have to make tough decisions, and they also have to think about the greater good and the whole, and not just individuals. And I think in the long run, these plan changes, I understand to you, they appear or they feel as if it's a downgrade. Um, well, most definitely it is. But for the greater good, the whole, the employees as a whole, all 50 employees that we have, it's definitely a benefit. It's definitely a step up from what we are offering. Well, I don't disagree with that. It's just you individually the single person, right. it's a downgrade for the single person who's not going to have any other married or dependents or anything. Now they got to pay. Anybody with a well, two person well, they don't have had to, it before. They don't have I to know pay. there's at least one other, maybe two. Now we got to pay. Well, they, and it, they say just a deductible. The out-of-pocket expense for me in this new plan is $10,000. 5000 for each person. That's after and the town pays. That's, half, that's what the whole plan is here. After that, well, probably no. take away the fifteen hundred. That's what it says on the on the paper that they gave us. Yeah, the plans do have out of pocket maxes, just like every other plan that yeah, has an out of plan. Yeah, yeah, that has an out of pocket max. But that when that's includes all of the deductibles, all of the co pays, all of the prescription drugs. I mean, that's essentially. Every single thing that you spend money on, but that's that's your out of pocket max. That's a that's a worst case scenario. That is when you experience a traumatic event and you're incurring hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of dollars of worth of bills. Um, they they've always had that. It's just it's a rarity that someone actually hits that out of pocket max. Okay, and is that out of pocket max calculated with? knowing that the town is paying half of the deductible. They don't care who's paying the deductible. They don't care. They don't care. So so it's really not that amount because the town's paying right. half so of the deductible. So if you're talking about a two-person plan $7, on the $3,000 deductible, it's, yeah, it's the 5000 per person. So the town's paying 1500 of that 5000 Gotcha. And who's first with the uh, deductible? The town pays the first half of the deductible. First half of it. Correct. I just don't think it's fair. And when they redid this personnel policy back in 2018, Butch Burbank was here. And he at least had the decency to say, we will cover the people with the plans that they had up until now. And that the plans changed then. So they, they've changed. Two or three, we've changed insurance before. And then now we're changing plans doing a, a different plan. I just don't think it's fair to any employee who's been here long, longer as I have, whether you like me or not, I don't, that's beside the point. We all I think like it that. all depends on who you are, if, if, what's going to happen with the thing, but that's neither here nor there. When the town went from Anthem to Harvard Pilgrim, were you at a zero deductible plan on Harvard Pilgrim? No. So this has happened before. We had no deductible. We had co-pays, but that was it. Uh, we'll have and to the co-pays in this plan went up. $5 only for a office visit, but the other, so there's some other things that went up. And it's, it's not beneficial to me. I don't feel. 
I realize you want to try to keep employees here or, or encourage new employees to come in here. But they're getting, I'm looking at it now as they're getting a, a better benefit than I got. Because they're all, you know, I wasn't offered a family plan when I came here. I had a family. I mean, I mean that, and, and the, that the, part I agree with you with. I mean, yeah. that we, we, this town has historically not offered family plans right. forever. Since whenever that date is on that time. Those and that's what we're talking about. Nine, it's detrimental. And, 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 and the town is facing stiff competition as far as trying to hire new employees. Right. And, and, and look at that part of it and say the last three or four important people that you hired are still here. And I know two of them don't even take the insurance. So to, to sit there and say, oh, we want to get more people here. And, I, and I, I agree with you want to try to get people here or to keep people from leaving. Correct. I knew there was a guy that worked with me. Yep. Left. Yep. Not one thing got offered to him to stay or find out what he needed or what it would take to get him to stay. That's not After true. After we trained him for a year and a half, two years. That's not true. I, I don't think that's true. That's not but, true. Well, that's what he told me. So. Conversations were had. Absolutely. And to your comment about the most recent people that they've hired who haven't taken the health insurance, it's because it wasn't offered to them like this. Right. Well, right. So that's why they didn't take the plan. But do they do, are are those people who don't take the insurance now? Are they still going to get a stipend? They sure are. Then I feel I should get a stipend because I'm for my deductible because I I've had it all all along, and they should, I wouldn't think they should get a stipend if the plan's offered to them. Here you go. This is offered to you. It still costs more money I for us that. to have a family plan on our in our personnel administration budget than it does to pay them the stipend. Still saving the town money by offering the stipend in lieu of health insurance. But you're offering them a benefit and they're not taking it. That's not the town's fault. It's a negotiation with their their compensation they're going to save the town money in their employment here over what they could be getting i mean f from a town's point of view it would be i think a poor decision to to take an employee who says okay we don't need the the whatever cost the ten thousand dollar um health insurance plan but if you give me a stipend to help with this that's half of that I mean, or, or when they work in their contract, they're negotiating a certain amount of money to offset their, exactly. their insurance, exactly. which they already get. Right. I mean, when we're, we're negotiating that, we look at the total compensation. What is the cost? I, I, yeah, I know how all that works. Right. So, so, so you're looking at just you, in, you specifically. Right. I'm not um, here fighting for any other employee. I mean, I didn't go to seek any employees okay. out to say, hey, they're trying to put screws to us or anything. It's going to cost us money. No matter how you look at it, it's going to cost every employee more money than the past plan that we had. That's not true. Not every employee. Because there are a lot of employees who are paying for the two-person plan or the family plan, and now they're not going to have to do that. Right. So it's not right. costing them more money. It's costing more money. Extrament what exponentially less money. We yeah. have employees who are taking family plans yeah. and they're paying the difference. Yeah. And that's over $400 per pay period coming out of their check. So they're paying $1,200 a month to have their family insured. They're now going to pay $0 a month to have their family insured. So yes, are there- but They're going to pay $9,000 deductible. They're going or half of it because the town's going to cover half. They're going to pay forty five hundred dollars. That's four months worth of payroll. And how deductions. many employees are going to jump to that? Do you have I any idea? I would say the majority of the employees that are on the plan now are yeah. going to stay on the plan, and they're going to get a better benefit by either adding their spouse or their dependent or turning to a family plan. I would say ninety nine percent of them are. And like I said, I'm not here about any other employee right. or anything like that. 
and I feel that I should at least get a, some sort of stipend to cover the other part of the deductible where I, it says that I am now getting it at no cost, just like it says in the personnel policy. What's the sense of having a personnel policy if you guys can pick and choose what you want to enforce? Well, I think we explained that we don't feel like we're doing that. I, I know you don't. And, but I know a lot of people think that the select board is, does things underhanded, and now I can see why. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. So, all right, Paul, you have your hand up. Let me get off mute. There you go. Yeah, I do. Uh, Karina, I guess the board, I'm just looking for an update um, on February 26th. Um, select board where I talked to you about the loom landing development parking lot concerns that I had. Um, and you were going to look at um <clears throat> for the landing loan and you were going to look at yeah potentially other the, areas in town right for the emergency way um I, I, and i guess my concern is that it's already starting and it is it's it's getting hectic already if they're parking by the cisterns by the <clears throat> by the uh, no parking signs where you can't get you wouldn't be able to get fire trucks around so i, I guess that's my uh, question is it have you made any progress on that no and honestly paul i haven't um but i will talk to the oh, chief no. <laughs> <laughs> i can i can lie to you if you like but uh, uh, um what's yeah um i'll talk to the i'll talk to the chief this week and see if we can't get a list together at the very least let's hold the public hearing just for the landing just for that area until we can um is it the only area that's the only place in town that they want to be able to write tickets instead of towing cars? Well, I think we also discussed potentially adding ladies bathtub into that, yep. uh, into that area as well. And then I know I, like I said, I, Chad said that there may be another area or two that he could think of, but let me, let me touch base with him again and we'll get it back on our radar. Let's do that. Yeah. Thank, thanks for the reminder. That kind of slipped off mine too. I oh, that's keep, all right. I, I just have to think about it because I go down there a lot. And um, this past holiday week, and and even this past weekend, it was, it was they were all, all the four places were full that were there. Plus, there was cars parked in front of the no parking fire department turnaround signs. Plus, there were cars parked along the roadway there. And I said, uh, it just I said there was something we talked about. And I couldn't remember, so I pulled it up on the line and would appreciate it if you could kind of. Put that on you. Back yep. there. Send them to my house, Paul. I'll start charging parking. 15 bucks a car. There you go. Perfect. Your hay, um, your hay socks are all gone, Jack. You should be smiling. <laughs> hey, Paul, just a quick question. Uh, how are the microphones working? Hey, actually, did you put new batteries in? We did. Yes. They're working terrible. No, they're working good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. They're working yeah. good. They are. I Maybe it's the batteries, because I can tell you now I... Now I have to kind of like tone it down a little bit before. I don't know how you how you tell. Maybe OJ talked about it at the planning board meeting. So maybe just replace them at the beginning of every meeting. But yeah, we ordered a, a big multi pack, and we're gonna just you know we read the instructions, and they mm -hmm. say to take them out. We're gonna do some things in house to try to extend the battery life. But we also um, just so you know, on the planning board level, we need to speak directly into the microphone. Like you need to actually sit up. You can't be sitting back. You can't be kind of gonna be like kind of right on top of it so in your face i am that's why i am thank you <laughs> thank thanks you. let's let's remember at the next planning board meeting to uh, at the very beginning to instruct all of us to to uh speak right into the microphones because again yep. i know i'd rather sit back like this and talk but if you can't hear me right. that's, that's and even good. even dave when he was speaking could you hear him fine too yeah i could hear dave fine yeah all right good I when you the only had the other thing you might want to do is order an extra. Remember, I talked to, to you about ordering an extra microphone for because when Carol's running the meeting, so she doesn't have to walk back and forth to the podium. Just a thought who, that whoever's running. Sometimes Ron's there. Or whoever's oh, there. get one for the desk. Yeah, but there's eight. Yeah. I, I, the limit's eight that we have the, the capacity limit, yeah, for. The yeah, eight. we have eight microphones. Oh, that's the limit. I'm sorry. So, I didn't realize yeah. that. On the system, we have there's eight inputs and there's eight microphones. We, it, we can have be at to, the podium or Cal. She'll have to take it with her. If she goes to the desk, she'll have to take her microphone with her. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Yeah. All right. No, that's fine. I, if you could have gotten an extra one, that would have been good, I think. But other than that, it's okay. 
We, maybe we'll take yours away and give it to Carol. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> I've got enough OJ. I can do that. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Thank you, oh, Paul. Okay. I can take it. I know you can. When you look into that ordinance and doing all that with the parking and whatnot, um, check and see what there needs to be for signs. I know if you're going to do no parking and we're going to tell you a car, it has to be signed. Well, there, there's, signs already, there's signs already installed out there with the... the they say no you're going to be ticketed. They are going to be towed. They say yes. they have the number on them. They have the phone number on them. But if you're changing that to ticketing... And, you know, well, it's, it's both. Just, it's still, oh, okay. It's still both. I mean, okay. I think ticketing is the first avenue, just because you know it brings in somewhat a little bit revenue right. and saves everyone from it saves Arnold from getting a you know boatload of cars. Thank you. Um, but um, it, well, it's essentially just cool. making that a fire lane. So, but there might be signage that's there might be signage that's requ that is required when it becomes a fire lane. So we will look into that. Okay, and there we is, yeah, there is there is signage, Karina. It says it's 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 a fire department um, access only right. emergency turnaround no parking. Yeah. Um, it, it actually lists Arnold's. It lists a PD's number. It gives the address of Arnold's where to go, and, and we we did that originally in conjunction with the with the PD just to make sure that it was done yeah, right. Ticketing but, is way better. Yeah, I mean at least to start, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I had people that just I talked to a couple of weeks ago that just parked right in front of a two by four sign that said fire department vehicle turnaround, no parking turnaround area. And they were parked, a big SUV was parked right in front of it. And when I asked them to move, it, it wasn't pretty. So um, that's why I said, sometimes you need a little bit of someone in blue there with a uniform and a gun. <laughs> All right, thank you. Did you have something else? No, sir, that's it. Thank All you. Right. Then is there any other public participation? Yes, Carol. And she remembered to go to the microphone. Thank you. Look at that. I just, I'm here on behalf of the Historical Society of Upper Pemigewasset Historical Society thanking the town of Lincoln for um, purchasing a set of the, the murals and hopefully you'll, you'll display them with honor. Absolutely. I love them. Oh, they're beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. So hopefully thank you, you for that. Them up. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. Yes. Thank you for that. And, and I just learned tonight that the um, explanation, what do you want to call it, description, uh, that was, was um, written by Lisa, her daughter. Yeah. I didn't know that. I thought that came from whatever, whoever did this in 1960. Um, well, so, she, took, she took the original right, right up and, and expounded on it. it Fantastic. Well, well, thank her for that. Because I was, okay. again, I didn't know that till you told me tonight. Okay. But um, no, these, these are great and we'll, figure out a way to get them framed appropriately and hung up with in some prominent place. Just a little history of Lincoln. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. All right. If there's no more uh, public participation, there's, there's nothing in non-public. OJ, I did have one other thing. Go ahead, Paul. Sorry about that. I, I know you had a meeting with Lou Martin about the traffic. Uh, can I ask what, ha what the gist of it was at the end? Um, we talked about uh, Loon Mountain purchasing a sign rather than renting a sign or getting us to rent a sign from DOT. That has happened and is in the works. We talked about adding a special detail um, on uh, certain weekends um, to help alleviate some of the traffic. Um, what else did we talk about? Um, we, we obviously talked about that major snowstorm. Um, where we had traffic backed up on the highway. Um, you know, essentially Loon's response to that was, is that that was due to um, some snow making equipment failing and then um, not being able to catch up after the fact. Snow removal. Equipment. Snow removal, yes. I was going to say, <laughs> it, it, was, it, was, it was not snow. Removal, it was snow. It was just removing it, yes. We had enough snow that weekend. Um, so they have changed things operationally for when those certain scenarios happen. They now have kind of an action item, you know, um, an action item list that they would need to do um, to also inform us in the town. We talked about uh, fire making capabilities. We, we talked about a couple of things, but the, the major takeaways were the additional signage, the additional uh, special details and then their new kind of operations in-house as far as when they have um, mechanical errors. Yeah, I mean, I think 
that all sounds good. I mean, I, I think a lot of that was a because you, you're right. I think some of the snow removal equipment wasn't operational or they didn't have operators for it. But that shouldn't be an impediment to the town or or business people who are trying to get up there. I mean, my business trying to get up there. I, I see it all went along, and it's. I think it's a matter of the how they structure their um, their parking um, and when they start pulling them into South Peak. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that that they're doing it in an appropriate manner that would allow the traffic to flow more smoothly. I'm, I'm not sure who runs it. I mean, I, I was trained by a guy named Bob Ayers and he was a, he was a tough old bird and he, he knew how to park them cars when they came into Loon and we never really had backups like this, you know, I mean, in a lot, even though there's been changes at Loon, the parking lots haven't changed in a, in a long, long time. I mean, we used to park them down at the Hobo. So we had to move staff down there to park um, at, at one time. But I think a lot of it is the timing to which they start taking cars in to South Peak. Uh, and sometimes there's just signs out there instead of people or maybe an officer down there. That actually tends to work a little better, I think, when I see it happen. But I believe it's all related to when they start um, parking cars down at South Peak. Um, I think that has a lot to do with it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, is there any more public input? All right, then we're going to take a recess for four minutes and then restart the meeting. Um, the the, the um, Campus World Public Input session a little bit after 5.30. Give people a chance to either get here or join us online. Bill, how you doing? Good, you? Good.
some of them are going to be a little better. She was just probably keeping it together. That's just moving money from the other fund. All right, young lady. We're running out of funds. Microphones and sitting so make sure it's online. Yours is not. Yeah, it is. Okay, now it's on, and you are speaking into it. All right. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. All right, I'm going to uh, call 
call the meeting back to order. Um, first of all, thank you all for, for coming and joining us, both in person and those who are joining us on the uh, Zoom call. Um, so, so just to kind of regroup and bring us all into the uh, purpose of this meeting, <clears throat> as you know, we the town uh, voted to purchase the Campus World property, 320-acre property up on Route 3 uh, at the town meeting. We are in the process of doing that. We are approaching a closing later this month. They're working on the um, title uh, report and closing documents, and we expect to do that at the very end of the month. Um, and then, then the, the land will officially be ours. Um, since then, or since the town meeting, we've had a couple of input sessions where we've heard from um, the residents of the town as far as ideas of what they think we should do or shouldn't do, what priorities are, et cetera. And um, as a result of the last meeting, we really thought we should get some input from um, people in the field to talk to us about what options, ideas, uh, you know, other program programs in other towns, what's out there that we should be aware of um, as, as a board of selectmen and as, as citizens, as far as what we should do or what are our options uh, to do with this property. So the, the purpose of tonight is really to, to sit and listen and get as much information and resources as we can from our, from our um, three invited guests and, and um, not necessarily ask them, you know, why we should or shouldn't do, do that and to have a debate about, you know, you know, this program is good. No, that one's terrible. As much as tell us what's available, what are our options? You know, what, what's the process for these? Let, let's, let's um, you know, I'm here to sit and listen to see what the options are. And I would anticipate at a future meeting, we would then as a as a board with with citizen input, then discuss which options we like, which ones are of higher priority, lower priority, or don't like at all, or what what things we should pursue, what further questions we should ask. So that's kind of where where this board is coming from as far as this meeting tonight. Um, so we are going to in invite, um, first of all, the um, experts who have come here with with knowledge and resources to share that, and then we'll invite the public to ask questions about the the programs or ideas or, or past projects that they might speak of, um, without again getting into the you know what we should do or shouldn't do. Um, so with that, I'll first introduce the people who are here. Andrew Dorset. Is is here. He's from. He is the housing finance director for the Department of Business and Economic Affairs with the state of New Hampshire. Next to him is is Harrison Kanzler, who's the executive director of AHEAD, which is up in Littleton and has projects here in Lincoln and Woodstock and um, really all around the North Country as far as different types of affordable housing. And then um, online, I believe we have Michelle Morin from North Country Council. Yep, I'm here, thank you. Thank you for joining us, Michelle. I'm sorry um, I couldn't be in person. Nope, that's, this is fine. It's a great way to join us and, and um, give us some input. So first I'm gonna um, uh, turn this over to um, Andrew from the state of New Hampshire and um, um, let, let him fill us in with some of his uh, input. Oh, it sounds like you have an exciting opportunity um in the town and the voters uh kind of brought that to you it's interesting and um uh i just talk a little bit about what i do I, my program is called invest new hampshire i'm at the business economic affairs department uh the program that i manage is a hundred million dollar fund uh we initially put 60 million dollars directly towards multifamily housing developments uh, those funds are all obligated in projects right now that are uh, in various stages, a lot of them already completed. Uh, we also had a program called the Municipal Per Unit Program. That one's still available. That's an incentive program that will pay municipalities $10,000 per affordable unit that is permitted. So, for example, if you were to permit a 100-unit uh, multifamily uh, project, that's workforce housing, which is, we, we define it as 80% AMI and below, which is you know, still pretty high rents. 
um, then we'll pay 10,000. So it'd be a million dollars to the municipality to do whatever they want with uh, for permitting those units. And we have a, a cap waiver process where a municipality can get up to $2 million through that program. And there are funds available, uh, likely I would say through September for that. Uh, we also have a demolition program, which has been really uh, heavily used Initially, the program was to demolish. You know, Harrison's using it. Maybe you want to talk about it. Uh, we initially we we wanted to have it available to control blight or you know help communities create new green spaces or parking lots or things that'll support housing. Um, we also learned that um, there was a big demand to repurpose old historic structures, and so we allowed for significant demolition inside of uh, mill buildings or just old buildings or. Uh, demolition work that was required to convert maybe a single family into like a four unit. And it also takes care of uh, environmental remediation. So anything that's associated with a building or the property. And that's limited at a half a million dollars for a community. But we also have a waiver process for that where a community can go up to a million if the demolition is going to directly create housing. Um, and we also have a program called the planning and zoning op grant. Um, we have a Quite a few partners that have been involved with that, New Hampshire Housing Finance, Plan New Hampshire, and uh, a number of uh, regional uh, planning and economic development groups have been involved. And that one really helps municipalities dig in, have community conversations about housing. What does it mean? What are the impacts? Uh, and then also look at your planning and zoning to see if there's areas that could be uh, amended or changed or added to help support uh, creating workforce housing. Uh, that program is being managed by uh, the New Hampshire House, New Hampshire uh, Housing Finance, uh, or New New Hampshire Housing Finance. Yeah, housing Finance. I always call them uh, New Hampshire yeah. Housing. So, um, and I think they have two point nine million left right now with a uh, application process. I think that opens up maybe this month for that. Now I have two new programs coming out. We just submitted the rules uh, Friday, so we expect to have an application applications available probably fall or late summer fall and one is called housing champions program and it, that does some of the similar things that exist with the planning uh, program we have now helps communities uh, start to work to uh, create better planning and zoning or improved planning and zoning that helps uh, housing it also can help municipalities with infrastructure and again it has the ten thousand dollars per unit uh, incentive for municipalities uh, and then we also have a new round of invest in H, which is going to be similar to what we do now. There's a lot less money involved. It's all state money. So, whereas this, the hundred million was through federal uh, money coming from ARPA. The new programs are 10 million and 5 million, million available total. So that's pretty much what I do. I mean, we're in a lot of interesting projects. We have about 3000 units that we're in that are under construction or completed. So I'm, I have a question. Yeah. Is that, <laughs> um, the second round of Invest New Hampshire, is it going to be all of the same Invest New Hampshire programs scale, like just scaled down as far as the award pools, or is it going to be sp specific parts? Like, is it? Going yeah, to be there, I mean, it, I would say it's going to be there is, there, for example, there is MPU and there okay. is uh, infrastructure, you know, to help municipalities out. Um, and there is a, a capital, capital program, but it is very scaled down, uh, right. you know, because we have $10 million. And, uh, um, you know, I, I'm not sure how it's all going to work out yet. It's the, these programs too were created with a lot of legislative input and advisory input. And so they became, I think a little more nuanced, I guess would be the right word, but you'll see. Yeah. <laughs> For example, the housing champions rules, I think are 65 pages where if you looked at our original documents, we tried to keep them around like five. So that's what, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. are questions from the public allowed at any time? Or are you just going to do it all at once? If you answer, I didn't hear you. My microphone off. Sorry, <laughs> I was going to do it after each speaker spoke. We'll see if there's questions for that particular speaker. Okay. And before we move on to the next one. So so yeah. I I had a, a, a question. So 
the one you talked about, I believe it was Invest in New Hampshire, um, with his ten thousand dollars per affordable unit permitted. That that implies then that the that a developer develops the units. We the town once permits them to be an affordable unit meeting that eighty percent. Um. 80% of you know yes, AM. in AMI. AMI. And then um that gets paid to the town, the developer yep. in yeah. cash. Is this a credit? Is how does this work? Okay. So the program that exists right now, uh, it's ten thousand dollars per unit that's affordable and restricted to be affordable for at least five years. So it's a pretty short timeline. Um the municipality or maybe another piece of its financing. For example, if they have some kind of a piece of financing through New Hampshire housing, uh, those usually have affordability restrictions already built in. So there has to be some mechanism to enforce it. Um, in some cases, the town just says, oh, we'll just sign an agreement with them and put it in their deed that it's for five years. And it goes directly to the town. And the restrictions, because of the pool of ARPA funds that, that it, it's come through, um, you're unrestricted. Once you get the money uh, as a municipality, you can use it. Say, Karina may have a great idea on how to build a finance stack to do some capital project, or maybe you want to offset uh, some increases in your budget to, you know, reduce taxes. I mean, you could do. You want to do a sewer line extension? You can really. It goes to your un, probably to your unreserved fund balance. I would imagine because. You know, no, so there's no restrictions on it. It yeah. can't just be used for public safety or utilities or water. It's essentially. Yep. As we see fit. That's right. Very yep. cool. So should the town partner with a private developer, then we could use as as an incentive or a portion of that to the private developer. We'll give you five grand for each restricted unit for minimum five years as affordability. That's that's a very creative uh thing. And I, there's a few communities that are doing things like that. For example, uh Newport, Vermont. It has taken a certain percentage of the MPU money and they use it to help offset uh, wastewater collection connection fees and water connection fees. Um, some have uh, created a revolving loan fund and put it right back out into, you know, giving, have, creating their own Invest New Hampshire type program, whether it be forgivable loans or lower interest loans. And uh, yeah, some are just like, like you said, they're really uh, just putting it right back in as, as an incentive, but sharing you know, with a developer, it's a very creative way to do it. So can I ask a question? Oh, sure, go ahead, Paul. So Andrew, this, the five years you're speaking about, that that's five years, is that, that's five years unrestricted as far as what? Oh, so the, what would happen is the, the project would have to maintain affordability uh, for the, the units that are being rewarded. So say it's a mixed use project and it's 200 units, 100 of them are at market rate, 100 are at 80% or lower. Uh, if the And Harrison is going to probably explain the 80% AMI. You can do it better than I. Um, but yeah, it, has to, it would have to be at that for five years. There's other nuances like to it. For example, you know, if you have a mixed use that's uh, market rate and affordable, the the unit sizes are supposed to remain the same. So you you can't have the uh, affordable ones all one bedroom and then the market rates all two. The right. mix has to be the same. So. And that was my concern. And I mean, the concern also that I have is that five years doesn't, if it goes into a developer's hands, five years may not be a relatively long period of time considering that, you know, most employee housing. I mean, these people are looking to stay there for longer than five years. I don't know, do the rates change at the end of that five-year period or can it, could a developer hypothetically change those rates at the end of that five-year term? Yeah. What we, what we found is that uh, our money most often isn't the only funding and it's limiting the, uh, the affordability. So if we, we have, we have roughly, I think right now, maybe around 80 awards, but in our direct capital or MPU is probably around 40 or 15. I think our average, the average uh, affordability period is I think around 36 years. So okay. there's, there's really uh, a lot of other sources that are requiring longer. But however, to your point, 
uh, the new program that we're releasing this late summer or fall, it has a 10 year, what, what we proposed was a 10 year affordability to just to your point to help um, create a little bit of a longer range. So now those, 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 those um, numbers are, are years that you're talking about being restricted. Mm -hmm. um, is, I assume that's a minimum. And if the deal that we make with the developer is for 30 years, that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Fine. As long as it's a five or more. In, in fact, that's what we find most often is that there's already something else in place uh, that requires a longer, a longer term. term. Okay. And just one other thing. So with the, with the MPU money right now, like we were talking about permitted units. So once you issue the permit, the developer picks that permit up. That's when you can go for the money. That's when you as a municipality have met all requirements of the grant. So you don't have to wait for the project to be completed that those funds are yours without risk. You know, you, you have to make it basically a determination that the project will be completed, but you've completed as a municipality, your, um, your, your requirements for it by the time they, they've been permitted with the new program, it's going to be certificate of occupancy. So, you know, they'll, they'll have to actually be done. Be done. So, I mean, well, that, that right. number can be negotiated obviously for the, the, the length of time. And certainly if there are, commingled funds between state and federal, i.e. HUD, or what have you for development. I mean, HUD has certain restrictions, as you know, and I know, when they issue monies for developments, and those can be up to, typically, it's a 20-year minimum hmm. with, with the federal dollars. I mean, the 202s or whatever some of the numbers that HUD builds out at, so. Yep, exactly. So, so Andrew, if this is Paul Bowden again. So who sets the standards as far as the, um, the ability for someone to take advantage of this, these, these affordable units? With our program, as far as like who could, who could uh, occupy the apartments? Yeah, so that, I mean, is, yeah, yeah. does the town have any input or is it just strictly set by the, um, the people who are given the money? So that's a great question. And I'll just say this, there's a difference between our program and how we operate and say, maybe if you get like a 9% or 4% low income housing tax credit through New Hampshire housing, like I, I know that some of the places, some of those programs, they want to actually look at the tenants who are occupying the, the, uh, um, the apartments. But with our program, we don't monitor who's occupying, we monitor the leases. So the, it's about not going over a certain lease. Uh, amount so um we're not going to say discriminate if you know a dental hygienist who's making you know over you know she, they're paying you know it, it's a much smaller portion of their their uh wages i guess than say somebody who's uh you know entry level uh, uh it's, it's the rents that are being capped yeah, not rents. the income of the residents yes. within the right. apartments or condominiums or whatever they may be exactly so the last question I have for you, Andrew, is the the monies that are made available. Um, I heard you speak somewhat about what else they could be used for, but could they be used? I mean, because you're aware the town has that 320 acres, but if they want to develop a, say, a park up there or something like that to be able to be um, used by the low income and towns people, what, what, would that be something that 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 type of financing may be able to be used for? Uh, they wouldn't be restricted from it. Uh, I'll give you an example. The, uh, I think I think the city of Keene, if I recall, I know they, they received a demolition uh, award through us. And I believe they also received an MPU. And I think they used some or both of those to create a skate park. They had to demolish some structures and uh, it was a allowable use of the funds. It was allowable use of the MPU and the demo for the demolition aspect of it. So thank you for your answers. Yeah. And just to add one more thing, if the, you know, and I'm, we've had discussions before, but there's probably so many ways that you could combine that money, you know, and using it for seed money with other grants or even other programs like, you know, creating TIF districts or, you know, other interesting ways to make it go further. So mm -hmm. create infrastructure. Growth. Would those funds be considered match dollars or because they're federal funds, you can't use them for other federal grants or are they um, or could they be used like, you know, NBRC money can be used as match money for federal grants. Would that be the same or no? 
So that's a, another very good question. So we've gone through a scenario where we've tried to analyze that and we're under what's called Treasury 6.1 guidance, revenue loss. And because the state already claimed this money mm -hmm. as lost revenue to re recap, that now it can be used as state money to match uh, okay. for federal dollars. Okay. Call so our program, so in our capital program, uh, affordable would be 80% to 50, rents affordable to persons uh, making 80 to 50% average median income. And Harrison can give you those numbers, what they actually are. In our MPU program, it's 80% and below for rental housing. How much does it cost to build a rental house? So we cap in our capital program, we determined that we would cap a, a uh, we, we would, a project would have to have a under 330,000 per unit uh, cost for development. So, and there were quite a few projects that came in that were well above that. You know, usually those ones would be something that had more of a specialty need, like um, maybe workforce housing for uh you know, people with developmental disabilities or um, ADA compliance. Yeah, ADA compliance issues. But, you know, and it, it's been interesting to see. I've seen so many projects come through that you can start to see some interesting trends. And uh, one thing that I found was small projects often have uh, uh, smaller redevelopment projects often have a lower per unit development cost, which has been pretty neat to see. But, there's also a lot of new technologies that are getting the prices down, like the modular. I know mm -hmm. Harrison's been looking at that, some modular technology. And What's modular? Uh, I think the last person we talked to, it was somewhere between $300 and $350 a square foot. Andrew, is there a requirement, uh, you mentioned eight, okay. is there a requirement for a specific percentage of these units to be fully compliant with ADA? I don't believe we had that requirement. If you, for the MPU program, if you want to exceed the cap to go for over a million to the two million, then the units that are created uh, or permitted uh, over the next group of 100 uh, units, they need to uh, have universal de design components, and you'd have to make a case of what components were used. We don't specify exactly which ones, but you have to just demonstrate universal design components have been included. Thank you. And, the, you know, I, would just, I would just also one comment about like the, co the high cost of development. I think that's one of the difficult things that we're seeing is that it's exactly the reason why, you know, these programs had to come into play. Uh, the market right now is just, it's very expensive and soft money, you know, some alternative monies have to be found to get into a finance stack to make an affordable housing project work. So otherwise the units are going to be market rate and they're really, uh, they, they're coming really high as you look around the state. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the with the property, but <clears throat> there's some significant development costs to accessing the property. Um, Route three is is the is the access point to the property, and it it immediately goes over the the um, Pem Pemigewasset River. There is a, an existing old bridge that used to be used to access the campground that was there. Um, but it's it's not wide enough for two-way traffic, and I'm not even sure. I mean, it's old. It seems structurally not good, but I mean, I'm not an engineer. I have no idea if it's even. That's about the South Mountain Bridge. Can't even cross that bridge. You can cross that with a horse and buggy. You'd be restricted. You can't go over it. Yeah, well, that's what I'm thinking, that, that it's going to need a new. It's only one lane no matter what, and it's. It's, I don't even know how old it is, but it's been here since I've lived in town. Um, so I'm, you know, it's going to be some significant getting water, sewer, and traffic over that river. Well, I'd encourage you to consider our MPU and <laughs> also, uh, you know, our next round of, of funding too. We will have some money for infrastructure. Really, it's not enough to probably touch what you're doing, but I know. Karina's creative in finding USDA, CDBG, 
northern borders, maybe a few other things, and you could start to piece together something. And you know, our money would really be just kind of initial seed money for infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So that's a very expensive. Now, so, that's something obviously that a developer will build into his cost. I mean, you know, like you say, there'll be certain units that will be workforce slash affordable. There will be certain ones at market rate and the market rate will bear the cost for the most part of the amenities, i.e. a bridge, road structure, water structure. I mean, because the taxpayers aren't going to be paying 15, 18 million dollars to put those in. I can assure you that. I mean, we can get some grants to help the developers offset some of those costs, but you know, you can't be, you know, putting the, the total burden on the taxpayer. And uh, have, has Lincoln used uh, tax incremental financing TIF districts? We have no. not. You know, this would we probably be a great place to consider that. Right. Um, you know, what that does is you take a geographic area and you, well, it, it depends if this is going to be owned by the the town or if it's going to be essentially it'll be eventually owned by a developer you need to have tax base in order to make a tiff district work but you can uh, pay for the infrastructure improvements off of the valuation increase so that that parcel itself is what's paying for all the infrastructure improvements in that uh, that area and then those don't um, impact the the existing taxpayers oh, 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 this Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm just a little confused here because has the Board of Selectmen made a decision as to the direction and what this property will be used? Because I know there are some people in town that are thinking it's going to be used for individual housing that's going to be long term and either built by the individuals or would some of this money be able to be used for that? Or is it is this all just strictly looking at it from a workforce housing perspective or a low income housing perspective and not um, looking at piecemealing any parcels out to um, those other people who had concerns? The, the board hasn't made any decisions. We're, we're in the exploring our e options. Exploring options. And that's why these, these good people are here today is to, to, help us understand what our options are or help not just us help the whole town and so thank you all right um, i just have one question on the mpu program is that like a rolling application program is there a deadline for that is there like a new uh application i guess uh a new you know, I, I know you said for some of the like the housing champions, that's going to be like a fall program. But is this already kind of going and yep. so until the, the money dries up? Right. Until the money dries up. I would expect that uh, we would probably be done with the MPU program, maybe September, um, October area. OK. And then there's a new one coming out about the same time. It'll, it's going to like I said, it's going to be more uh, rigid with a lot more um, requirements. For example, to in order to get access to it, your community has to be first become designated as a housing champion community, um, which has its own, uh, you know, list of criteria that need yeah. to happen. So, okay, yeah, but the program that's going right now is definitely the uh, the easier one to, to go after. Okay, excellent. Then, um, Garrison, do you want to talk about ahead? Sure. Yeah, and and I can give some numbers. I know I think people probably want to hear some of that piece as far as what what is eighty percent, what is sixty percent, what does all of that mean. So I'll do if it's all right. I'll do a rough yeah, primer yeah. on just yes housing affordability in general, and then we can talk a bit about what we do and how that might work. So to, uh, in the state of New Hampshire, we do have a workforce housing law that defines in new state statute what is workforce. Workforce housing is either rental housing that meets 60% of the area median income, and we'll come back to that in a second, but either meets 60% of area median income um, as affordable or purchase housing to uh, the gentleman online's question about um, long-term single family homes. That also is covered by workforce housing in the state of New Hampshire, and that's up to 100% of the area median income for purchase. Um, area median income is simple and complicated when you get into it with housing, but basically um, take every 
every income in Grafton County. It's always calculated on a county basis, which is somewhat unfortunate for you all because you have the different towns you have in Grafton County. Um, but you take all the incomes made in Grafton and line them up from lowest to highest. And what's in the middle, that's the median. So what we're saying is that uh, workforce housing means it is affordable for someone making 60% of that median. Affordable means it's 30% of your gross monthly income going towards housing. Anything over that, and you're considered economically burdened by your housing. Um, and I know that is a lot of jargon and is confusing, so I will give you some numbers to help you um, just kind of get positioning in your head. So for, for Grafton County, um, the median income is $108,200. So that is considered the median income. So when we're saying it has to be affordable off 60% of that, 80% of that, luckily it's close to 100, so you can almost just say 60% is 60,000. Um, so again, 80% income is 86,560, 60% is 64,920. So those are the income ranges that we're talking about. So when Andrew was saying, you know, this, we're, we're talking about 80% rents, that means a rent affordable to someone who's making $86,560 a year. Now it's really important to stress that we're not talking necessarily about an individual making that much money. When we're talking about rental affordability, it is considering a family of three. So that is, it could be a single parent with two kids who's making 86,000. It could be to a dual income family with, a, with one child or with a dependent adult um, who are both making a little over 40,000 a year, right? So it's just, we, it, it doesn't, when it comes to our level, it doesn't matter where the money is coming from or how many people are earning the money. That's just the income level that we're looking for. Um, so when we're talking about rents, um, you know, if, if you're using the Invest New Hampshire program, a two bedroom unit would have to be rented at $1,947 a month in order to meet 80% area median income. All of those rent figures are considered gross rent, which means it has to include utilities. The state allows for, I think, about $250 per, um, in Grafton County um, for utilities. So you take that $1,900, take $250 off of it. You're talking about $1,700 a month is what it would have to be rented at to get the Invest New Hampshire programs. Um, that's a two-bedroom. There's different numbers depending on one, two, three, four bedroom, all of that. Um, when you're talking about uh, workforce rentals uh, and the low-income housing tax credit, which you had mentioned, that's a lot of what we do is the low-income housing tax credit developments. Um, a, that's a lot longer term. So if we were to, the next application round is uh, going to be starting up, I think, in the fall. Um, if, if someone were able to get an application in for that, uh, rural projects are seeing two two to four application rounds before they actually get the award. Um, there's typically 12 to 15 projects in the state that go for the low-income housing tax credit, and um, they only award four a year. So it would be likely three years before someone who was putting in that application would actually get it, and then it's going to be about another year from that point until they can actually be breaking ground. Uh, Low-income housing tax credit is usually tied to 60 and 50% area median income. 60 is considered low income. Um, 60 is considered workforce. 50 is considered low income. So, and to give you an idea, that same two-bedroom figure um, at 60%, it's $1,400 a month. At 50%, it's $1,200 a month. So that's the rents that we, that we're talking about when we're talking about low-income rent for Grafton County. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure you had those numbers. As far as the purchase, if you wanted to do like a starter home development um, or do some duplexes or condo um, that's for sale and is trying to be affordable, uh, again, the state does look at that. It's going to be more at that 108,000 um, is the income range they're going to be looking at. And that actually equates to a sale price of about $326,000 is what those could sell for to be considered workforce housing as a sale price. Um, I know I live, I live just over the pass here in North Conway. It's where I'm from. So I, I actually want to start by saying, regardless as to what 
how how you all voted on it. I'm wildly impressed that the community did this. I, I wish Conway had done it 20 years ago. We'd probably be in a much better place. So good on all of you for making this decision. Uh, well, you might, but I um but i i you know i will say um there there are a lot of different options um you know i i know i obviously being in north conway fully understand the concern um about making sure it is long-term housing if anyone is using federal dollars like the low-income housing tax credit that is a program through hud so it's federal money that trickles down through the state um obviously that has that must be long term that can't we can't rent any of those units short term they would never let us do that um when it comes to producing single family homes that would obviously be a concern i know um new hampshire housing uh, new hampshire housing finance authority did a report on short term rental um they collected a bunch of short term rental data and Lincoln, I don't know if you've seen the report, but congratulations, you all had the highest percentage of um, units that are short-term rentals online at 42.5%. Your housing stock is short-term rental. Um, Conway was fourth. I was, I was, uh, thought we'd be higher than that, but we made it in the top five anyhow. Um, so it's certainly a concern. And I know that um, I, I helped, I worked with North Country Council and I worked with the town of Conway and we created an ordinance in Conway um, where folks can develop single family homes on a higher density to yield essentially more affordable for purchase housing. And one of the caveats from the town is it, they cannot be short term rented. They must be a permanent residence. Otherwise, you, you the essentially the town gets right of first refusal to buy that back from the developer and then they sell it back on the open market to someone who can buy it affordably so they can essentially take the house back uh, because it violates zoning if they are using it for short-term rental um so there it there's definitely mechanisms to do that um i i think it would be a wise decision that being said, as as you mentioned, Jack, there are certainly um, from a developer standpoint, if you can have some houses, as much as you might not love the idea that don't have that restriction, they're going to be able to help bankroll the full the full scale development of the parcel if that was something you were looking at. So it might be a tool to utilize higher sale values so that you can put some more money back into affordability of other units within the project. Um, we are looking at a single family development right now that AHEAD is doing. Um, we're looking at that potentially in Bethlehem. And that uses a model that's called shared equity housing. So essentially, it's uh, we build the home. And I believe it was you might have asked what the price per square foot is. We're seeing it's just north of $300 a square foot. So if we wanted to build you know, a 1,000 square foot ranch home, um, be a tight three bedroom or a decently sized two bedroom, um, you know, it's going to be $300,000 just for us to build it. So if we then layer on our costs for time and everything, that would be selling it uh, and not to mention the land acquisition costs, infrastructure costs, all of that, um, that tends to push that a development of that size home up to about $400,000. And that's, again, if we sold it break even. Um, we would want to put some amount of income onto it so that we could build more homes. Um, so what we do is we estimate, okay, if we're going to try to sell these houses for $450,000, we would then bring in subsidy to bring that price down and then turn around and sell it to someone um, who is going to use it as a permanent residence for closer to two hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, that means we're essentially putting subsidy in equivalent to about fifty percent of the property's value, in order to sell it back to that person. That comes with restrictions. Obviously, long-term living is a big part of that. It has to be your primary residence. Um, you cannot own a second home, so it, it, it can be your only home. Um, and then there are actually resale restrictions on it as well to help perpetuate the affordability through multiple resales. Um, it is going to diminish the amount of money someone can make 10 years down the road when they go to sell that house, but they will still get equity when they sell the house, as opposed to being in a rental where after 10 years they leave and hope they get their security deposit back. Um, so we are looking to get into the single family space. Um, 
we already do rental as well, obviously, um, based on the numbers, based on a lot of social studies, um, they have found that it, I would, I would certainly say it's probably in the community's best interest to consider it being a mixed income development. It shouldn't be all workforce or shouldn't be necessarily all open market rate. There would be a benefit, a vested benefit to the community to see some mix within there. Um, it also is healthier, especially if you have folks who are who are purchasing something at an affordable level to have market rate homes in there. It just helps when it comes to appraisal values when they go to sell that home to make sure that it's essentially you're not getting spot um, spot appraising where that one part of the community is getting assessed at a lower value because it's all affordable homes, right? That's obviously practices that are illegal, but do happen. So um, the best way to fight that um, and any bias there is to make sure that it's a mixed income part of the community. So I know I, I did watch your last um, meeting and there were a couple of things that came up that I, I just wanted to touch on. Um, someone had mentioned the idea of um, a housing authority. And I know, uh, Jack, that you had said you were not in favor of that idea. And I will say I spoke to Conway. So that was brought up in Conway as well. I agree. I actually, it's not saying this from a head's position of wanting to be one to maybe do development here, but that we do manage property and it is a lot of work and it is very expensive to do and it's becoming increasingly more expensive. So it's it might not be advantageous for the community to consider that. However, for those of you out there who might be interested, um, the power for the town to do that is under RSA 2034. Um, and that's the power for a municipality to create housing authority should they want to. Um, I also, so just for information that came up, uh, another one is I know that um, folks were referencing uh, the loss of teachers and police due to the lack of housing. Uh, I don't know what the pay is like in this area, but I, you know, again, when you're looking at um, tar if you're if you're trying to target specific um, like skilled labor positions, you do want to take into consideration what is the municipality or what is the school district paying for those positions? And then kind of back that into, okay, well, what kind of housing do you want? Or is, are you likely going to be seeing a teacher, uh, you know, a teacher's family making that 86,000, that's going to be 80% or are they more likely making somewhere in the 64,000, um, 65,000 range? That's, that would lead you to maybe want to consider more rental housing because that is what is going to meet their need based on these numbers. So um, something for you all to consider, you know you know better than I in that regard. Um, and there was one other piece that I confess, I am now forgetting that came up in the, oh, oh it was, I apologize. It, I, I think someone asked it earlier as well, which was, can, can you target the housing demographically? So can this housing be for single mothers, right? Or can this housing be specifically for, you know, what X, Y, or Z group? Uh, I will tell you, as a nonprofit developer, we don't love doing that. Um, we're often bringing in federal dollars, and that means we're, we have to adhere very closely to federal fair housing law. And while there are carve-outs, it's a lot of work to justify using those carve-outs or steering around them, especially when it comes to the application pool. Um, so we tend to not go for any specific group. The easiest one is elderly. So um, it's what, 63 and older. So that's that's a pretty easy one to figure out. Uh, otherwise, you could look to partner. And again, um, most developers would be willing to do this. The municipality, you all would have the ability to do this and making an agreement to transfer the land um, is to find a group that works with a specific demographic. So like a VA, a, a veteran affairs type group who would do specifically veteran housing um, or with a, um, you know, a group that specializes in uh, domestic violence or something like that, who can work with those groups and know those laws better uh, than we do. I would, I would recommend that's probably your best course of action. If there's a specific group you want to provide housing for in the community. Um, otherwise, generally from a nonprofit developer perspective or a for-profit developer perspective, it's just going to be open housing to, you know, again, we we're tied by these incomes and we do have, we do have to verify the income. So if we make, if I do 
a low income housing tax credit and I have a unit that's for someone making 60%, it's for someone making $64,920. If they're making $65,000, I have to say, sorry, you can't have this unit. You make too much money, right? So I, we, when it comes to, to Andrew's point, when it comes to some of the funding we're going to stack with things like Invest New Hampshire, it will end up capping how much money the, our tenants make. Um, and it also typically, again, 20, 30 years is what we're looking for for our requirements. So even though you might have a program that only requires five or 10 years, typically we're putting enough subsidy in it that we're going to be looking at much longer terms than that. I know we have a few properties that um, hit uh, 99 years that we have to keep them affordable. Um, so you know we, we have them all over the place uh, as far as the duration of affordability. Um, so I apologize if that was long and rambling, but that's, that was there's, a, there's a lot. So, um, and I, and I'm, I'm obviously happy to answer questions and I, I will apologize in advance. I um, love handing out business cards and hate putting more in my wallet. So I don't have any with me, um, but if you want to talk to Karina, she has my email and please feel free to reach out anytime. I'm happy to answer questions or just spitball things. A couple of comments here. Sure. Um, first of all, as a direct, former director of a housing authority and the state president of 252 housing authorities. I mean, we, through the housing industry, were able to have a priority ranking. And you know what that is, both of you know what that is. So we would give a priority to people who lived in our community, all yes. worked in our community. Yep. We would give a, a to disabled, we would give, we could give one to veterans mm -hmm. um, and over 65. So without violation of fair right. housing laws. Yes. And that was the thing. Um, I talked to HUD uh, about three or four months ago. Their FMRs are different than what your, HUD's like one bedroom was $1,101, two bedroom was fourteen forty six, and three bedroom was eighteen seventy eight. One of the things that a developer could look at here and in concert with the state might be to some apply for some project-based certificates. Therefore, that would help subsidize the rent. Um, you know, somebody that was a real low income, I had people living in my developments where the average rent was $1,000 in our community. They were paying $28 a month. They were elderly. That was their pension. They were paying, as we know, 30% of their adjusted gross income. Um, and, you know, that was for a single individual. So, but the feds were picking up the rest in the Section 8 program, you know, in subsidy. So, you know, we had uh, 500 and something Section 8s and total of 2,000 units. But, I mean, there's ways that we can partner with the state with a developer to make sure that it's truly affordable for those, you know, because when you start throwing out $1,900, $2,400, right. I mean, you know, that's a lot of money. That's is, higher yeah. than what the average rent, uh, you know, in, in a lot of communities are. And I think there's what, 88 communities in Grafton County. And, you know, um, it, we're pushed up, as you said, Harrison, by some of the other communities, the higher yeah, income, number I, on, you know, yeah that make our, um, you know, total income, uh, FMRs, uh, not the FMRs, but the uh, medium family income, you know, I think HUD uses the number 115,000, even higher than the state, so. You know. And and so just real real quick, so FMR is fair market rate. And so that, that would be different. These are what I'm looking at. Fair market rate um, is gonna be variable from this. These numbers are from, April. So they just updated them at the end of April. So that might be part of the discrepancy. Yeah. Um, how fair market works is that, um, let's say I have this two bedroom at 60% for $1,400 and you have a housing voucher. Um, that housing voucher means that you only pay 30% of your income, no matter what your income is. So if your gross monthly income is $100, your rent to me is going to be $30. Obviously, I cannot run an apartment building if all of my apartments are renting for $30 a month. So what the housing voucher does is pay the difference between what your 30% is and the fair market rate, the FMR, on that unit. Um, so that's where I get my rent money. And FMR tends to, tends to be slightly different than the, like the static 60% or the static 50%. So that might be where that difference comes from. And I will say, um, so in New Hampshire, in the state of New Hampshire, um, 
project-based vouchers all run through New Hampshire housing. And at present, they will only give them out on a 4% low-income housing tax credit deal. And if you're doing a 4%, you're going to probably need to be doing at least 100 units in a phase. Um, we, and I will say that's not a scale that we operate on. We typically are looking to about 30 units a phase. So we haven't been able to successfully put in an application for a 4% round. Um, it just, because it's, it's a lot. Um, and to give you an idea where we do have a, a two phase development we're working on in Woodstock. Um, the first phase is third is 29 units. It's 30 units. Um, that is I believe our numbers on that right now, it's about $11 million for us to do that. And that's going to be 20 apartments and then nine townhouse um, apartment units. They're all apartments, but some of them will be in a, in like an apartment building and then others are more in a townhouse style apartment rental. Um, so the construction prices are very high. And so when you're talking now, having to do a hundred units to get that 4% and bring in those, that's, that's something that is a bit outside of the scope of what we are able to do. Um, but we can certainly work on partnerships. Um, you know, I think most nonprofit developers are pretty happy to play in the sandbox together. I don't see a reason why you couldn't have multiple nonprofit developers working in the same space, applying for different programs or the same programs and just bringing in more applications to the community. Yeah. Um, it's certainly possible. So. Yeah. Just that, that Woodstock 29 units. You said it was an eleven million dollar overall cost. It's something around there. Yeah. Okay, ballpark. Yep. Did that include land acquisition? Yes. It did. Yep. So you paid for the land, and then you're going to build the units. I assume that is a, a place where there's town water and town yes. sewer. Yep. Okay. We can't if there's not town water and sewer. We are not doing it. You're not, you're out. Yeah. Okay. It's just for density. I mean we. Right. The cost to put in a, a well and septic to facilitate something of that scale is going to make it not affordable pretty quickly. Oh, did I have some questions? Okay, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get the gentleman's name. Sorry, my name is yeah. Har Harrison Kanzler. Harrison, that's that's fine. I just want to call you by your name, uh, Harrison. Um, they touched, or you touched on the. Um, Targeted housing. Yep. So, so based on that, um, can a head, if you do some of this housing, can it be just for Lincoln um, employees only? So Jack, Jack touched on that. And I mean, the simple answer is no. Um, okay. We can, we can have priority scoring, which means that essentially if, if I have, three applications that come in all at once for an apartment or in roughly the same time frame, and one of them is from a local and two of them are from folks who are from away, I can prioritize the local person and put them in the unit. Um, can I just outrightly, if I have an open unit, outrightly reject anyone who is not employed locally? No, I can't do that. Now, oh there, are, there are some carve outs to that. If I have market rate units that don't have any federal subsidy in them, then, then I could do that in theory. Um, and that would be where the lo local employers could get involved. If they wanted to put a pool of funds together to invest into the project and secure some units, you could do it that way. Um, so if, Harrison, if, if, there was, if there were developers involved in this, consortium that the, it, for this 320 acres. And I had um, said to the developers, you put some money in, we'll put some money in. Can then it be more targeted <laughs> towards um, Lincoln employees? I think it certainly could be. Um, you you might run into some folks, again, if it's private, um, it's done a little differently. Where we're a nonprofit, I would have to run it by my board to see if they feel that that's within our mission. Um, so it, it might be difficult for us to justify it. Um, but I think that we likely could. I know in, it's what, we're, what we're talking about is a model called employer-assisted housing. Um, which is something that is being looked at in the state. I know North Country Council is looking at it, so Michelle might speak more to that. Um, but there are a variety of ways that it can work. One way that it can work is essentially um, if I have some market rate units, I can actually just, 
I could go to, I'll use Loon. I don't know how happy people will be with that example, but if I, if I <laughs> rent five units to Loon, Loon is actually my tenant. They're on the lease. They pay me every month, regardless as to whether or not there's someone in that unit. Um, they then have a sublet agreement with their employees that might have employment as a requirement for the housing. Um, it might alter the rent, in which case they would be subsidizing the difference as far as, you know, if, if I say you have to pay me 1500 bucks a month, they might have a valuable employee who they know is not making that much. And they say, hey, the rent's going to be $1,250. we are going to shell in $250 a month um, to make this work for you. So there, there's a variety of ways in which that can work. And sublet agreements uh, have a lot less stringent uh, legal ties than a direct landlord-tenant relationship does. So if my tenant is, again, the employer, um, then they can set up much more stringent regulations with their employees as far as how that lease looks. That's, that's, called, a ma that's called a master lease system. And, and, and I just wanted to remind the board and people that, you know, there's not very many developers who work on nonprofit, <laughs> at least in Lincoln. Um, and, and, and that most of the like the vouchers or the subsidized housing, unless it comes from a private individual or a group or company, it comes from, other than that, it comes from tax dollars that are raised by people who pay the taxes either to the federal government or to local or state authorities. So I think we just wanna be mindful of how much other people are raising to, 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 do, to do that. Can I ask you a question for, for a head? As as part part of the three hundred and twenty acres, if we had a piece of land, you would your group would come in uh, possibly and build a whatever thirty unit a twenty nine unit apartment building like you did in Woodstock. We I mean we could that's a, that's a possibility. We're look yeah I mean what you know we we could we would what we would likely do is do some public engagement somewhat akin to this and hear from all of you. I mean, luckily you kind of have done that footwork, but we would, we would ultimately try to build as close to what the community wants as we could. Okay. So if the community wants single family homes, that's what we would try to do and do it affordably. If they want, if rental is more going to hit what the community feels is the targeted need for the community, we would seek to do that. We could also do both. I mean, we could do two, three phases and do rental in one and purchase in the other, and you could mix it up. Well, we'd have to bring it if there's water and sewer on Route Three. So we would we that would be I think to Jack's point earlier that would be part of our project. So we would do that. We would have to build a new bridge. We would have to bring the utilities across with the bridge. We would, the developer would do that. Yeah. yeah. And, and so to Andrew's earlier point, you know, likely that would be using something like the community development block grant, um, as well as some other funding. Community development block grants typically have affordability restrictions of 10 years, 15 years, depending on what you do. Um, you know, that's going to cap at $500,000, but that, would likely be a large chunk of fixing up the bridge and getting the utilities across. That's probably about all it would do. Then you'd have to find other funding somewhere to then get it to site. Yeah. Down road two. Yeah. What's engineering would you have to have road two? None. We would we would we would do that. Yep. Yeah. We would we would put out RFPs, we would get architects, we would get engineers, we would had do all of that in house. Well, not we wouldn't do it in house. We we'd pay someone to do it, but we would do it ourselves. And just state your name for the minutes, please. Thank you. Oh, it sounded like what you were saying is that there could be developers. Is Can it, you push the button on? and turn it on? Sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, my name is Celeste. And so if I understood you correctly. You were mentioning that there could be a couple of developers. So maybe somebody that's working with a head and they have 20 acres. And then there's another developer that has 50 acres and they're you're doing your own thing on each piece of land. But there's a level of coordination uh, with roads or 
Okay. So there, there likely would be um, when you're talking kidding. about, yeah, when you're, so when you're talking about multi, multiple developers being involved, you know, obviously yeah. the number one question is going to be who's, who is doing that initial bridge and in infrastructure repair. Um, but then obviously it gets into broader questions. If I've got the, I'm trying to think the parcel kind of like bubbles out on what, I guess the South. Mm -hmm. um, if I had that portion there and then someone had the stuff up on the Hill, I don't know if there would be views up there, but for sake of argument, let's say there are, and that's going to be just a, a typical market rate developer because they want to utilize that viewpoint to get higher income. Um, we would probably have to have some sort of conversation or the town would be the ones who would really facilitate that as far as I'm not from the bridge, just going to make a road go this way and they're going to make one go this way. And it's all over the place. We'd want to structure it in such a way that it's going to make sense for all of the development that is going to be done on that lot. Um, and obviously if we're doing that, uh, you know, there is benefit with a for-profit developer to have someone like a head involved because we can, we can bring in federal money. We are a registered 501c3, so we have access to a lot of funding opportunities that a private developer, a, a private for-profit developer does not have access to. So we can, if they work with us, it is going to be advantageous to them to do that because we can help subsidize those costs. It's a simple solution. How would you see it working? Let's say the first project we do is with a head, whether it's in a apartments or single family houses, but, or combination. If you put in the bridge and you bring the water and sewer across the river and up to whatever point your project location is, how do you see the participation of future developers over the next five years, um, uh, uh, reimbursing or sharing whatever the cost of, of that initial infrastructure? Well, so it's, assuming the town was not going to adopt that infrastructure they it would come through in the fact that they would be participating in the upkeep costs moving forward again we'd be bringing a lot of subsidy into it to begin with um it might be that as we structure a road maintenance agreement moving forward it is prorated based on when the development was built so later phases have to pay a higher cost in to help defer the fact that they didn't participate in the initial investment in that mm -hmm. infrastructure would be something along those lines would would probably be the easiest way to structure it um i will very selfishly and very non from a non-profit standpoint also say you you may also want to consider carving out a back lot and selling that first to a for-profit developer who is going to put in really high-end homes and have them and the second homeowners pay to get all of that stuff in so that we can make the housing more affordably off of mm -hmm. their existing infrastructure. Um, so there's, so we can do it with subsidy, but to the, to the point of, you know, that is taxpayer dollars and all of that. We, you could also have, have the tourism industry pay for that by selling off a back lot for market rate houses. And those are going to go in faster. Um, you know, I, I will be honest and say that working with a, a nonprofit developer, this isn't, quick work. Um, it would take us probably several years before we were breaking ground. Um, a for-profit developer is going to be moving at a much faster pace than we are. So that that is something that you may want to consider. Um, you, you can certainly subdivide the lot and sell it to different developers. Um, and you could, I would think you could put the caveats on that the initial for 100 feet or however long after the crossing of the river, it has to be a straight road, you know, so that people can build off of it in different ways, what have you. Um, that would be up to, I would think, your planning board or town, uh, I don't know if you have town engineer, but something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Harrison, if I could ask you a question, maybe it's either for you or the board. Um, so someone spoke a little bit about it, but the maintenance and the cost uh, after development. Who is that? Who, who picks up all of that as far as the infrastructure, the bridge? The how is that typically determined? So I I can't I guess speak to how it functions. It, I know in in most of the communities we work in, the town, the road, any infrastructure put in is private um, until the town votes to adopt it. So it would be handled by an HOA. 
So there, were, there would be road maintenance agreements, there would be HOA covenants that would be put into place that would cover the cost to maintain all of that once it's in place. Um, that, that, that's a pretty serious yes. uh, infrastructure cost, you know, to be able yeah, to- Yeah, br the bridge in particular like would town. be- It's a small tough. town, you know? Yep. And, and, and the other question I have for you, and maybe Karina, maybe you could help me out here with this question. So if we, if all this is built on what I understand is a smaller cost per square foot, um, does a tax assessment reflect that so that the people, the low income or whatever, the elderly or whoever are up there, um, are they paying taxes on current market rate or how does that work? Uh, they would pay taxes on the current market rate. Value, yeah, right? the current assessed value. But we also need to realize that the town's equalization rate currently is at 67%. So we are yeah, only we are only taxing currently at 67% of the fair market value. So that will change during the next reval. Um, but but, yeah, but think, I mean, yeah. it will be based on fair market. It will be, we will follow the same rules as we always, you know, as we always do with DRA, we'll get a revaluation every five years. At, at the fifth year or year one of our reval, we hope to have our equalization rate in the high 90s. But as time goes on, and especially in today's real estate market, we've seen huge jumps, 10% um, jump over the last three years. So, and, and, that, and that's one of the concerns. Yeah, I have, like every that community so like, in, in New Hampshire is facing. Yeah, not just, we're, not, we're not alone we're not in that. that. We're oh, not no, alone. no, no, I know that. I, I, but I'm just concerned that people who are, who are less fortunate and buy or try to build and they build and they're building these at less than market rate pricing and then when their taxes come in they got to pay their taxes too you right know, but so if you, they're you, being sold at less if they're being sold i mean i think this goes back to i can't remember if andrew or harrison made the point is you want a mixed community you want some of the areas of the community to have the higher assessed value and then you want them to have some of the lower assessed value so if in this area of town most of the homes are selling for that three hundred thousand dollar mark the home is going to be assessed closer to that three hundred thousand dollar mark we see that at right. south peak south peak you you have the multi-million dollar homes going in, you can guarantee most of those homes in that neighborhood are going to be in that same range. And 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 that's a that's a great assessment, except for the fact that I think when OJ was talking originally that this piece of property is going to not only support low income or affordable housing or whatever, but it was also there were going to be pods or sections that were going to be privately developed uh, and the developer could put whatever they wanted in there. So you may have sections that are in there that are low to moderate income and then you may have sections in this uh piece of property that are very high value um that could be three three million dollar houses you know so how does that you know i i, I just want to put that in for food for thought you know that, sure. the, the three million dollars paul but the three million dollar home is going to have six bedrooms and four bathrooms and five thousand oh, yeah. 5,000 square feet, right? In the, the, the 1,000 square foot, one bedroom, two bedroom home is, is going to be, have a much lower assessed value. You know, you, they, they are, it's an apples to orange comparison when you're talking about. Well, I, Green, I don't know that. And the only reason I can say that is that take a look in town. So some of the older housing that was worth not very much today <laughs> is selling for $400,000. They probably bought it for I don't know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars back in the day. Absolutely so, I mean, right. You know, you know, so you're looking at that, and, and some of the that housing will make that change. I mean, there'll be a turnaround time where it will make that change, and, right. and that's that's a concern. I think, or just a comment that you ought to consider that when we're looking at it. You know, sure, so, correct. But there's one other thing to consider is that if there's two houses of similar size and square footage. If one has a deed restriction that says you can't rent this out for short-term rentals, and one has no deed restriction that says you can do anything you want, the fair market value of that unrestricted house is, is inevitably going to be higher than the restricted one. And that's going to that's gonna have an effect on the assessed value and therefore the taxes. So keep that in mind too. And I, if, right. if I may, Wait, if Gar I may Garrison. sorry. Oh, yeah, uh, not, oh, Paul, Paul, hold on. Garrison's, Paul, hold on. 
Yeah, uh, listen. Yeah, I just the one the one thing I do I know you had talked about like self uh, self help uh, self self help construction housing kind of a habitat for humanity yep. style habitat. Same I talked about shared equity housing that we're looking at. Both of those I don't know to Paul's point there. Um, yes, they would be paying assessed value, but when they go to sell that house, they are limited on what they can sell it for and who they can sell it to. And so that would prevent them from buying that house for one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars and turning around five years down the road and flipping so it for five hundred. Right? They can't right. do that. Right. So it it and and by by that alone, it is going to impact again the fair market value, and you're going to see that reduced kind of pro- some somewhat reduced property tax for those individuals. So good point. Thank you, yep. Bill. Me personally. No, we've we've had people look at um, the existing topographical map maps from up there and give guesses. But as far as like an engineer going up, no, no, right? Well, I'll 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 tell you this. Right now, and even with the inclusion of the new South Peak water tank that's going in, our elevation level, our building limit level, is going to be right around that twelve hundred the twelve hundred foot mark. That 1,200 foot mark bisects that property in half. So we're talking about not necessarily 320 developable acres. We're talking maybe 150, 160 developable acres because we just won't have fire suppression and and, and the water um, needs that we'll need to develop the whole property. Right. Not that that couldn't change in the future, but at this point that we're not considering putting a water tank up there. But at some point, or or some developer may some right, you know, and and it, it just go back to the infrastructure question. Another possibility, as as um, Garrison pointed out, is for the town to accept the roads and water and sewer as a town road, and have that be town maintenance versus um, homeowners association. Typically, this town has not done this um, for all of these, you know, planned developments, you know, that are you know, a, a lo- well, that would certainly be something to keep keep in mind in building this out is to is to build it to the town road spec so that it, it would be a possibility. And I also think that alleviates some of the concerns we heard at the last meeting that if the town were willing to accept these roads and water and sewer and utilities, you eliminate the need for a home ownership, right? So then you don't have those additional added costs onto your monthly rent. Association, right, right? Yes, yeah. Right now, no. If someone went off of the town road and built a whatever forty-unit condo development, you know, with multiple roads, that could be a homeowners association up there. But the main road, water, sewer going in, just like on my road and your road, would be would be town owned, maintained. Could, could be, could be. By the same token, the last couple of major developments, I mean, Forest Ridge, the homeowners own the systems in there. The Village of Loon, they own the systems in there. And, and the landing, they own the system. The homeowners own it there. They're not town roads. They're, you know, So, you know, I mean, a lot of people have said that, you know, why should I pay the burden for another development? I mean, again, that's up to the taxpayers. If we try to make the goal of this property be a um, Lincoln community, and and it would benefit the the you know residents of our community for it to be a town road. If that's not what we're going for, then it may not. I mean, it would have to depend on what we um, ultimately decide this land is going to be. Yep. And again, that's not a really de- decision that no. I'm thinking of even talking about tonight, no. but that's that's a good point. I just don't get it. I mean, those in some of the roads you use around here to avoid traffic on the street. Otherwise, you wouldn't ride up on the street. You know, it's a ball of road. It's true. 
All right. Well, I live in Nairobi. We used to be like, uh, I didn't get any kids on the streets. Mm -hmm. Now you got about eight kids graduating high school and worried about where you're going to put the beaches. I'd be more worried about where the beaches are going to work themselves. Well, if All we right. can build some houses that locals can afford and get some kids, and again, in that's sweet. We'll seven million dollars. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks for the questions. Uh, we do have um, Michelle Morin Gray, who's here with us by Zoom. Um, she's with North Country Council. Um, Michelle, do you want to take over and speak to us? Yeah. Sure, I'll talk a little bit. Um, it's great to go last because um, my favorite partners, both ahead and um, New Hampshire BEA, really has outlined uh, a lot of the housing programs and you know how things work in in that realm quite well. And so, you know, North Country Council never works alone with the municipality. We always bring our partners in um, when we're looking at different projects, and um, you know, all of the funding sources for any projects such as this has been mentioned this evening. Um, we work closely with those funders um, as far as helping to provide technical assistance on submitting applications and administering and following compliance of those funds. Once they're received, um, the one fund that wasn't mentioned too specifically was Northern Borders Regional Commission funds. And I just wanna throw that out there that um, Lincoln currently has an MBRC fund, and so it has to be 75% spent before you would go for another one. I think in this case, you know, traditionally we see those MBRC funds being um, utilized to support job creation, but I think this is really could potentially be a story for these funds to be used to support the infrastructure, um, and it would really have to go towards infrastructure in support of workforce housing. So um, I don't think it's out of the question. It's just whether or not um, it would be the timing. And one thing to remember for your community, anytime you look at MBRC funds, is Grafton County as a whole is not eligible for MBRC funds historically and, and traditionally. I have never seen Grafton County not be eligible um, for funds. However, there's what they consider isolated areas of distress. And so Lincoln, Lincoln often falls into that um, bucket of isolated area distress, therefore making it eligible for funds. And so that is determined on a yearly basis. So it's always good to look at that and see where Lincoln's falling on that. Um, and as far as, you know, what kind of support and assistance we can provide, um, you know, we can provide assistance in facilitating community conversations, like Harrison said, you know, looking, you know, if if they're coming in and looking at the property and um, looking to see what the community wants to do with it, we can obviously help facilitate some of those community conversations, very much like you would do kind of a charrette or potentially um, a session for a public outreach for a master plan or something like that. Um, you can do something specific to housing. We did that in the community of Franconia. It was in conjunction with the update of their master plan, but we did a very specific housing um, open house kind of community information day. And so those are some of the things that we can come in with some of our staff and te technical assistance and support the community as you go through kind of um, wrapping your head around what you want to see this property look like and become in the future. Um, the other thing, you know, depending on what's happening and the timing of all that, it's always great to reach out to us because we typically can support um, you're reaching out and applying for some of the HOP funds or Invest New Hampshire. I would seriously consider looking at some of those funds as a community regardless, especially the demolition fund. Um, if you have properties in town, even though it's not really associated with this property, if you have properties in town that you're looking to um, kind of you know, if they're blighted, looking to remove them to kind of resolve that space so that it could be something else. Just remember that those funds, as long as they're going to housing, um, they can be used elsewhere, which means they could be used to look at conceptual ideas or plans or an engaging, you know, um, a firm or an entity to start looking at this property deeper. So that's just something to keep in mind that how you could use those current demolition funds that are out there and available right now. Michelle, uh, 
NBRC, you said it has to be 75% spent for us to apply for an additional NBRC uh, uh, funding. Is that our share or is that project total? Um, that is project total. It's both okay. match and, and project total. You can get a waiver for it. And I think, you know, potentially in your case, because um, your project is a little bit older, it is moving now, which is nice. The holdups were not on, on, on you. It was the difficulty of the project in the sense that, you know, you have a federal partner in there other than NBRC. So it makes things move a little bit um, slower. And so I think that if you were to look at those funds in the near future, you could seek a waiver of that 75% spent um, and see how that goes. And right now there's two rounds. And so um, this year, there's two rounds. The next round is gonna be coming up. Um, and I, I think they're gonna go for two rounds again in the future as well. So it will no longer be just the kind of uh, February, March round. So um, thank you. Michelle? Yeah. This is Paul Bowden. Um, can you tell me what qualifies Lincoln as an area of distress? Why, why, why we qualify? Yeah, so it's a combination of demographics that MBRC at their level, their federal le level that they calculate. And so um, I can send a link for the distress criteria. It's right on MBRC's website. And so, you know, we've talked a little bit about 60% and 80%. I think their calculation is created by um, median household income, um, percent of poverty, and possibly population. So it's it's a, a you know three or four demographic um, traits that they put in there, and that's how they determine it. Do, do they rate them by state? So does each town get rated individually amongst the state? Um. So there's certain areas that are eligible period for MBRC funding. So um, certain counties that are eligible. So not all counties in the state of New Hampshire are eligible. Um, but what they do look at it is they look at it at the county level first. And then if the county qualifies as a whole, like Coas County um, is eligible for MBRC funds and they're a distressed county. So every municipality within Coas County is eligible. Carroll County goes in and out of um, uh, in and out of attainment. So they some years or yes. So Carroll County some years they're eligible, some years they're not, and so they're typically running as a transition county. But Grafton is always what they call an attainment county, which means they're not eligible. And so once that county is determined as a, at the county level not eligible, they then look at all the municipalities in that county and determine if there's an isolated area of distress. And Lincoln is one of those isolated areas. Um, it goes in and out between years. I did not look at it this year because I knew there was an active grant and I didn't have any um, any other organizations in Lincoln that were interested in MBRC funds. Um, so I would have to look that up and see, but it's always good when MBRC announces that grant, um, grant uh, award that the round is open. I mean, it's always good to take a look at that distress criteria and see if you're eligible. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Sure. Michelle, can you send a link for that, that criteria to yeah. uh, town manager at lincolnnh.org? Sure can. Right? Yes. <laughs> All right, any, anything else for us? Should I open up for questions, Michelle? Oh, sure. Yeah, I'll take any questions. Any other, any questions for Michelle? Go ahead, Gary. Do yeah, you want to use use the use the microphone, please? Thank you. I'm Gary Casangino. I live in Lincoln. Uh, other people probably know, but I don't know. What is Lincoln's current MDRC project? Uh, it's the South Peak water tank. Um, so we are in the process of uh, hopefully constructing a road to the additional water tank this summer and then constructing the tank itself next year. Good question. Anything else? Well, first of all, thank the three of you for... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I do it? Yep. Yeah. Can, you, can you expound a little bit and tell us all that are listening in tonight, 
and people that are there, where you intend on going from here, how, what's the process? What do you? Sure. How do you see it going? Chris, I, I think that tonight was very helpful that the, the board and citizens got some input on ideas for funding and grants and in project types. Um, I would say that the next step for this would be for the for the board to kind of let this all sink in and then to discuss this again at an open public meeting and and um, see what route we want to get down and what what which of these um, ideas may want to pursue immediately, um, which ones we want to keep in mind and maybe do uh, later. But um, again, do that with 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 some public input. And I would say again, I'd like to keep this this whole thing moving forward. Um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna um, own this property at the end of the month, which means we're gonna be incurring interest fees at the end of the month. And let's um, let's move this along and 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 make something happen. So I don't know what um, how itineraries look like, but I'm thinking like in um, two meetings from now. If we can have this back on the agenda um, for us to discuss and and see what what route we want to take. Oh, Jay, are are there? Excuse me, but are there are, are there timelines um, for some of this funding? Um, and if so, I guess how would that affect the decision making and 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 things going forward? I mean, uh, Harrison talked, Andrew Dorset talked, Michelle talked, but I mean. Nobody really spoke about timelines and uh, in relationship to funding and how that could affect decisions going forward. Yeah, I think Paul Andrew spoke to specific timelines, um, you know, funding uh, grants closing certain dates. So I think the board will act sooner than later. I know that's what I want to do. I was just because Andrew, go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Like I think maybe we'll we'll probably continue the conversation. Um, you know, to look at our programs and try to see how you could potentially take advantage of them as quickly as possible. And also the ones going forward, what, you know, what kind of strategies might work if you want to uh, look at our programs in the future too. So we can, we can continue that um, through the town manager's office. Right. So are there, are there developer interest as well, OJ, that, that, that would affect any of this decision-making and does that need to be explored? I, I think the board needs to to bring this up again. I think this is an internal discussion with with the board and the citizens um, that we don't need to to sit you know here tonight with with the uh, invited guests. But I think that could be at our next meeting or the one after that to do exactly that. All right, thank you. Yeah, Celeste. Sure. So I'm just curious. At what point do you think the land needs to be assessed to determine? How much is usable at this time, or how you're going to perhaps divide it up? You know, what might be HUD, what might be ahead? Like, where does that fall into what's happening in your mind? You know, I think personally that that would be up to a developer, Celeste. Um, you know, the developer will look at the land in one way and say, I can build single here. Another developer may say, no, I can build a, um, you know, triplex there or I could build a condo building there. Um, you know, I envision, and I, I don't speak for the board, but I speak for myself and my, and my wife sometimes. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, we will, I would like to see us put out some type of an RFQ or an RFP for a developer and list certain criteria and put restrictions on the land so we know what we're getting and what a developer will get. And it will meet the needs of what we hear from the community, what the board feels is necessary, and the best way to accomplish those goals. And I think the next meeting or two is when we need to determine mm -hmm. what those certain criteria are. Yeah. Go ahead, Jerry. Hey, yeah. Hi, Jerry Stringham, um, state rep. Uh, Harrison, Paul, Michelle, thanks for uh, speaking today. I just wanted to throw one more thing that for you guys to put in your pocket, and that is 
that at the county level, we still have about $2.1 million of uncommitted ARPA funds that have to be committed by the end of December. So, um, you know, if there's anything I can take to the commission or to the executive board that fits, maybe maybe the bridge project itself or uh, putting in a water line or something that... Um, Yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Joey. Um, again, this could be a, 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 a multi-entity type of project if, you know, if a head is involved and then there's some state grant money or county grant money to, to move ahead with uh, whether it's the bridge or water and sewer or whatever. So... Uh, um, to, to put this on the calendar, I'm just looking. I said two meetings from now. Yeah, I know. And then, then we're into – our next meeting is two weeks from tonight. I, I, that's what my – because the next meeting is the joint one with Woodstock, and then we don't meet again until July 15th, which is a month and a half away. Uh, uh, July 17th. Wait, June 7th. Let's, that's that's what we're thinking of using doing that one. And then July one. I don't want to wait until July one because that. No, I think we can put it on the seventeenth. I think it's going to take probably more than one meeting to yeah. do it to hash this out. So let's just start let's, on the seventeenth. Okay. Do you want to do four o'clock again mm -hmm. with the BOS meeting, and then five thirty for the, or not, or just do it all at five thirty. I don't, I, I don't care. Let, let's do the board of selectmen's meeting at our regular five thirty time. Okay. With with a with a um a target to start the discussion on campus world at six. Um, and, and if we have to stop our board meeting, go to campus okay. world, come back okay. to the board Perfect. meeting, we can certainly do that. Perfect. Um, I, I think that would be fair, but let's do that at the next meeting on the 17th, rather than waiting six more weeks. Yeah, Mon Monday, the 17th yeah, at six o'clock. And we're going to notice the board meeting for five with an agenda item for Campus World starting around six o'clock. All right, so regular BOS at five. Five thirty. You just or did you I say five? You can see some call. We could do it at five and give us an hour. Let's do it. Do it at five. Give us an hour. Okay, and then we'll by just like we did today. And six o'clock. Yeah. We'll start the Campus World discussion. Okay, perfect. All right, so moved. Thank you all for yes. being here. Thank you so much. This is really unique for for us and the town to even be yeah. talk, none of us are expert have ever done anything like this before so this was very informative and very helpful very helpful thank you, all three of you for coming michelle yeah. thank you for joining us online no thank you sorry I um, couldn't be oh, that's fine it was all right we so uh -uh. have non-public yes um if there's nothing else the board is going to make a motion to go into non-public to discuss a personnel issue and i don't know if there's any update yeah we do want to talk about legal, legal. the jace jason um thank you all for coming update. thank you everyone for coming yeah I wonder if I'm going to